if strong people were stalemated in the search for peace and harmony, what was to become of our erratic band of alcoholics? As we had once struggled and prayed for individual recovery, just so earnestly did we commence to quest for the principles through which AA itself might survive. On anvils of experience, the structure of our society was hammered out. Countless times, in as many cities and hamlets, we reenacted the story of Eddie Rickenbacker and his courageous company when their plane crashed in the Pacific. Like us, they had suddenly found themselves saved from death, but still floating upon a perilous sea. How well they saw that their common welfare came first. None might become selfish of water or bread. Each needed to consider the others, and in abiding faith they knew they must find their real strength. And this they did find, in measure to transcend all the defects of their frail craft, every test of uncertainty, pain, fear, and despair, and even the death of one. Thus has it been with A.A., by faith and by works, we have been able to build upon the lessons of an incredible experience. They live today in the twelve traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, God willing, shall sustain us in unity for so long as he may need us. The Twelve Traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous 1. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. 2. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. 3. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. 4. Each group should be autonomous, except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. 5. Each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. 6. An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. 7. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. 8. Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. 9. AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. 10. Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. 11. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. On behalf of my friend Paul and I, I'd like to welcome you guys all here today. Cumulatively, Paul and I have, uh, I guess, close to 60 years of sobriety, and, uh, and so we're happy to share what we've learned along the way with you guys. We're also gifted to have lots of other people here that have long-term sobriety. Since this is being recorded, we'll maintain personal anonymity because it may at some point be listened to by people who are not members of Alcoholics Anonymous, and so we're going to introduce ourselves by our first names and omit our last name, even though... Dr. Bob was famous for saying, Paul? He's famous for saying that in a meeting, you use your full name in any AA gathering if it was not going to be at the, at the level of press, radio, film, anything public. It's the same way that if, if you're asked to speak at an, an organization, 
a civic group or whatever it is, uh, you're still asked to use what your first name only. Paul, do you want to start us off with page 15? On page 15 of the 12 and 12. Which is the foreword to the 12 and 12. It's not a numbered page. And it reads as follows. AA's 12 traditions apply to the life of the fellowship itself. They outline the means in which AA maintains its unity and relates itself to the world about it, the way it lives and grows. And then in the paragraph on top of that, it says, AA's 12 steps are a set of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and make the sufferer happily and usefully whole. So the traditions work at the group level, but we can also put them to work at the individual level. And the steps work at the individual level. Some people like to say that the steps are there to keep us from killing ourselves and the traditions are there to keep us from killing other people. <laughs> and with that, we'll start with tradition one, which is on page 129. Tradition one at the top of the page says, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. The unity of Alcoholics Anonymous is the most cherished quality our society has. Our lives, the lives of all to come, depend squarely upon it. We stay whole or AA dies. Without unity, the heart of AA could cease to beat. Our world arteries would no longer carry the life-giving grace of God. His gift to us would be spent aimlessly. Back again in their caves, alcoholics would reproach us and say, What a great thing AA might have been. Does this mean, some will anxiously ask, that in AA the individual doesn't count for much? Is he to be dominated by his group and swallowed up in it? We may certainly answer this question with a loud no. We believe there isn't a fellowship on earth which lavishes more devoted care upon its individual members. Surely there is none which more jealously guards the individual's right to think, talk, and act as he wishes. No AA can compel another to do anything. Nobody can be punished or expelled. Our 12 steps to recovery are suggestions. The 12 traditions which guarantee AA's unity contain not a single don't. They repeatedly say, we ought, but never, you must. Too many minds all this liberty for the individual spells sheer anarchy. Every newcomer, every friend who looks at AA for the first time is greatly puzzled. They see liberty verging on license, yet they recognize at once that AA has an irresistible strength of purpose and action. How, they ask, can such a crowd of anarchists function at all? How can they possibly place their common welfare first? What in heaven's name holds them together? Those who look closely soon have the key to this strange paradox. The AA member has to conform to the principles of recovery. His life actually depends upon obedience to spiritual principles. If he deviates too far, the penalty is sure and swift. He sickens and dies. At first he goes along because he must, but later he discovers a way of life he really wants to live. Moreover, he finds he cannot keep this priceless gift unless he gives it away. Neither he nor anybody else can survive unless he carries the AA message. The moment this 12th step work forms a group, another discovery is made, that most individuals cannot recover unless there is a group. Realization dawns that he is but a small part of a great whole, that no personal sacrifice is too great for preservation of the fellowship. He learns that the clamor of desires and ambitions within him must be silenced whenever these could damage the group. It becomes plain that the group must survive or the individual will not. So, at the outset, how best to live and work together as groups became the prime question. In the world about us, we saw personalities destroying whole peoples. The struggle for wealth, power, and prestige was tearing humanity apart as never before. If strong people were stalemated in the search for peace and harmony, what was to become of our erratic band of alcoholics? As we had once struggled and prayed for individual recovery, Just so earnestly did we commence to quest for the principles through which AA itself might survive. On anvils of experience, the structure of our society was hammered out. Countless times, in as many cities and hamlets, we reenacted the story of Eddie Rickenbacker and his courageous company when their plane crashed in the Pacific. Like us, they had suddenly found themselves saved from death, but still floating upon a perilous sea. How well they saw that their common welfare came first. 
None might become selfish of water or bread. Each needed to consider the others, and in abiding faith, they knew they must find their real strength. And this they did find, in measure to transcend all the defects of their frail craft, every test of uncertainty, pain, fear, and despair, and even the death of one. Thus it has been with AA. By faith and by works, we have been able to build upon the lessons of an incredible experience. They live today in the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, God willing, shall sustain us in unity for so long as he may need us. So the first tradition is uh, probably, if you could rank them in order of importance, probably one of the most important traditions. And some of the things we covered, if you'll look back on page 129, just to summarize, the top of page 129, about four lines down from the top, it says, without unity, the heart of AA would cease to beat. The world arteries would no longer carry the life-giving grace of God. His gift to us would be spent aimlessly. Back again in their caves, alcoholics would reproach us and say, what a great thing AA might have been. So unity is the foundation stone of Alcoholics Anonymous. Without unity at the group level or at the intergroup level, then AA won't work at all. And therefore, unity is just as important between each of us as individuals. Obviously, if one of us is, is at odds with another, either one or both people won't feel comfortable going to meetings. You know, won't feel comfortable with the idea of running into the person that they don't like so much. So somebody's sobriety is at jeopardy at that point. And then skipping down just to near the bottom of the page, it says, no AA can compel another to do anything. Nobody can be punished or expelled. Our 12 steps of recovery are suggestions. The 12 traditions, which guarantee AA's unity, contain not a single don't. They repeatedly say we ought, but never you must. There are no bosses in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is what's going to bring us into the second tradition as we move forward. There's no leaders with authority or power. And no AA can tell another AA what to do at any time. Even if the other AA is completely wrong, which most of us know the other people usually are. (laughs) No matter what, there's nobody that bosses anybody else around in Alcoholics Anonymous. And most importantly, nobody can be expelled. And uh, it brings me back to when I was living in Israel, and there was only one meeting in all of Jerusalem. And, uh, and so attendance at meetings was hard to get to because there was only one, and people came from far and wide to attend that one meeting. They had two Daves at this meeting, and the Daves didn't like each other. <laughs> and they would often get in disagreements. And one of the Daves used walking sticks. For some reason, he was partially paralyzed, so he had to walk with sticks. It wasn't uncommon to hear the Daves yelling at each other during the meeting outside, you know, in the coffee area, because they seemed to both get coffee at the same time quite perfectly. And, uh, and so one day we were in the meeting, and the two Daves were yelling at each other, and then you heard this loud clang as the walking sticks went flying, and, uh, and then a thud as the one Dave hit the other Dave, and then a second thud as that Dave hit the ground. And uh, so the question for the group was, What do we do in that situation? The conflict was if they were to tell that Dave that he couldn't come to AA meetings anymore, it was like signing his death sentence. And we'll read that when we get into the third tradition. So the decision was that we explained to the two Daves that each of them had to come to a meeting on the different night. And so the solution was to keep them separated. And they were given the nights that they could come to meetings and, uh, and it worked out quite well. And eventually they made up and, you know, went on until the next spat occurred, I'm sure. Paul, do you want to share some experience with the first tradition? One thing I've got to look at, and I've got to ask myself, am I a uniter or a divider? So I've learned that I'm, I'm, I'm a divider if I criticize a group. I'm dividing that group. Oh, that group's no good or you can't do this, that. Now, and where I hurt there, I hurt <coughs> AA uh, because what that happens is, is... Someone hears it and say, well, I'm not going to go to that group. When that group could have been just exactly what that individual need. I go one step further. and uh, uh, AA, uh, AA clubhouses are not AA, but they're closely associated in the sense that there's a lot of AA meetings within clubhouses. So if I criticize one clubhouse or the other, I'm, 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 I'm uh, dividing them from that because they may not go to that club because I was told it's no good, or because 
they do this or they do that. I've been in many AA meetings and, and clubhouses, but I'm going to talk AA meetings, where they said, you can't talk about this, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, I've gone to them. I'm a brown whiskey sort of guy. But other little things do come in. I, I understand that. But they're still good meetings. And to me, it's very important when I look at this, the most individuals cannot recover unless there is a group. And I got to keep that in mind. And if it's a group that's always at dissension and this and that, it, it drives people away. Thank you so much. And if you look in the middle of page 130, just about five lines down from the top of the second paragraph there that starts those who look closely, it says, if he deviates too far from the, pen the penalty is sure and swift, he sickens and dies. At first he goes along because he must, but later he discovers a way of life he really wants to live. Moreover, he finds he cannot keep this priceless gift unless he gives it away. So at first we go along with the traditions in Alcoholics Anonymous because it's important for us to fit in. And then we find out that if we don't uphold the traditions in Alcoholics Anonymous that we damage Alcoholics Anonymous, and we need AA to be here if we're going to survive. Any questions about the first tradition? By the way, that follows, too, in my family. Yeah. Am I trying to dominate the family, and it's got to be this way, it's got to be that way? Am I yipping and yelling at my spouse and the kids, your sister and brother? Just a thought. Dad, Paul brings up a great idea. One of the things about the traditions is that we can put them to work in our personal lives. Any questions on the first tradition? Yeah, Bill, go ahead. I'm Bill. I'm an alcoholic. This uh, paragraph uh, that says down here where it says that uh, uh, they repeatedly say we ought but never you must. Uh, the 12 traditions guarantee A's you know, contain not a single don't. And the importance of that for me is, is uh, at least when I came in the program and also when I helped somebody else that had been a friend of mine who came in the program, it doesn't, it doesn't recognize the importance right away, but uh, there's a variation on the serenity prayer, which goes, uh, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot uh, change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to keep my mouth shut, even when I know I'm right. Yeah. Because it doesn't say don't give uh, a bad advice. It says don't give advice, period. And I think that's the hardest thing to do, because we'll say at the beginning of meetings, don't give advice, and then we'll give advice when there's a newcomer. We'll say, come to 90 meetings in 90 days. Get a sponsor and help them through the steps. That's all advice, and which is prohibited to some degree in this concern. I can say this is what I did, but I can't say this is something that you should do. And I think that's, that's a very, very important quality of the first of the faith for me, at least. Thanks for letting us here. Thanks, Bill. And it's not prohibited. But they tell us that was on the bottom of page 129 where Bill read. And then on 130, they tell us right away, there's no rules. Nobody can tell anybody what to do. But if a person in AA deviates too far from what the directions and the traditions give, they drink. And that's the ultimate punishment. We don't need to expel anybody. If we deviate too far from the traditions, we expel ourselves. We cut ourselves off from the group. And an alcoholic alone is in bad company, as they say. Any other questions or comments on Tradition 1? Moving forward with Tradition 2. Top of page 132. Tradition 2. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority. A loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience, our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. And this is one of the traditions that we spoke about that we're going to skip a little bit in the reading. So Mary Catherine's going to read the first paragraph. Where does... Where does AA get its direction? Who runs it? This, too, is a puzzler for every friend and newcomer. When told that our society has no president having authority to govern it, no treasurer who can compel the payment of any dues, no board of directors who can cast an erring member into outer darkness, when indeed no AA can give another a directive and enforce obedience, our friends gasp and exclaim, This simply can't be. There must be an angle somewhere. These practical folk... Then read Tradition 2 and learn that the sole authority in AA is a loving God as he may express himself in the group conscience. They dubiously ask an experienced AA member if this really works. The member, saying to all appearances, immediately answers, yes, it definitely does. The friends mutter that this looks vague, nebulous, pretty naive to them. 
Then they commenced to watch us with speculative eyes, pick up a fragment of AA history, and soon have the solid facts. So then they're going to go on to tell us a story about a group that they call the Middleton Group, and they pick on Middletown repeatedly throughout the traditions. Paul, do you know from the history of AA where Middletown actually was? I asked an AA historian, and he said it was in Charleston, West Virginia. Where did you get sober? L uh, 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 Richmond, Virginia. Close to Charleston. Well, uh, mm. yeah, well, I wouldn't want to walk it. <laughs> <laughs> So then we're going to get into a, into a slight description on page 133 about how this guy moves to a new town, starts an AA group. And at first, it's important that he does run the show because nobody else would be able to do anything if he wasn't organizing. And then on page 134, at the top of the page, they start talking where it says, now comes the election. What happens once this guy kind of kicks AA off and some other folks join in and, and they start seeing that things should go differently? Top of page 134. Now comes the election. If the founder and his friends have served well, they may, to their surprise, be reinstated for a time. If, however, they have heavily resisted the rising tide of democracy, they may be summarily beached. In either case, the group now has a so-called rotating committee, very sharply limited in its authority. In no sense whatever can its members govern or direct the group. They are servants. Theirs is the sometimes thankless privilege of doing the group's chores. Headed by the chairman, they look after public relations and arrange meetings. Their treasurer, strictly accountable, takes money from the hat that is passed, banks it, pays the rent and other bills, and makes a regular report at business meetings. The secretary sees that literature is on the table, looks after the phone answering service, answers the mail, and sends out notices of meetings. Such are the simple services that enable the group to function. The committee gives no spiritual advice, judges no one's conduct, issues no orders. Every one of them may be promptly eliminated at the next election if they try this. And so they make the belated discovery that they are really servants, not senators. These are universal experiences. Thus, throughout AA does the group conscience decree the terms upon which its leaders shall serve. And any, anybody who's been in a service position in Alcoholics Anonymous knows there's, there is really no authority involved and there's a lot of thankless work. <laughs> and uh, it's the best way to stay sober is to do service work because nobody's going to say thank you. So it's truly the kind of giving that knows no reward. And uh, then on page 135, you'll notice just down from the top on page 135, it introduces two terms that many of us are familiar with. The elder statesman, statesman and the bleeding deacons. And it says on page 135, five lines, five lines down from the top, the elder statesman is the one who sees the wisdom of the group's decision, who holds no resentment over his reduced status, whose judgment fortified by considerable experience is sound, and who is willing to sit quietly on the sidelines, patiently awaiting developments. The bleeding deacon is the one who is just as surely convinced that the group cannot get along without him, who constantly connives for re-election to office, and who continues to be consumed with self-pity. Unfortunately, it says a few hemorrhage so badly that they end up drinking. And historically in AA, we know that to be true, but it's definitely something that we can look at for ourselves. Whenever we're about to comment on a decision that the group has made or somebody else in the group is taking an action in some way, just ask yourself, am I going to be a bleeding deacon or am I going to be an elder statesman in this situation? And you don't have to have a lot of time and sobriety to make a choice which path you want to go down. Down to the bottom of page 135, Mary Catherine's going to start reading, When AA Was Only Three Years Old. When AA was only three years old, an event occurred demonstrating this principle. One of the first members of AA, entirely contrary to his own desires, was obliged to conform to group opinion. Here's the story in his words. And so one thing you'll notice if you read through the traditions or as you read through the traditions is there's a lot of stories in the traditions. And this is really, in a way, speaking to the humility that Bill Wilson had because most of the stories are embarrassing stories about Bill Wilson. <laughs> and he put them in here to show that, you know, we learned a lot from my mistakes. And this is story particularly is where Bill Wilson got a job offer at Towns Hospital, which was the place where he had originally met Dr. Silkworth and, and sobered up, and really where all of AA's roots kind of draw from. The idea of the allergic reaction, as it's summarized in the doctor's opinion in the big book, came from Dr. Silkworth, who was working at Towns Hospital. And he carried that message to Bill Wilson, who then 
as we know, carried it to Dr. Bob later in 1935, and, uh, and luckily for us, to the rest of the world. Skipping down to the bottom of page 136, we'll, we'll talk about what happened after Bill got this, uh, got this job offer. I was bowled over. I was bowled over. There were a few twinges of conscience until I saw how really ethical Charlie's proposal was. There was nothing wrong, whatever, with becoming a lay therapist. I thought of Lois coming home exhausted from the department store each day, only to cook supper for a house full of drunks who weren't paying board. I thought of the large sum of money still owing my Wall Street creditors. I thought of a few of my alcoholic friends who were making as much money as ever. Why shouldn't I do as well as they? Skipping down, if you go to the next paragraph where it says I was, it was meeting night, one thing that's important to, to know is that at this point in time, it's true that Bill Wilson was not working, and everybody else in AA had kind of gotten back to their feet, at least the 20 people or so that were sober in New York City. And this, it's not written here in the tradition, but it's in the book Alcoholics Anonymous Comes of Age, and it's a part of AA history. At this point, the other alcoholics really felt bad about Bill not being able to go back to work. But Bill was running the central office. Bill and a fellow named Hank P. had started writing the big book. And there was nobody else to do that work. And they actually composed a letter to Bill Wilson. And they said to Bill, we know that you're hard up. And we know they had just lost their house to foreclosure. Bill and, and Lois, his wife, were couch surfing. They were living on other people's couches in Alcoholics Anonymous for two years straight. And they wrote a letter to Bill Wilson. They said, we know your heart up. We often wish we could do something about it. And we've got to ask something that we really have no right to ask. Don't take the job. Stay on doing the thing with Alcoholics Anonymous. Because if you don't do it, it won't get done. And it's too important to not do it. It's the most amazing thing. You can find the letter. They've got a copy of it at the Akron Archives. And I know they have a copy of it in New York also. Continuing in the middle of page 137, it was meeting night. It was meeting night. Although none of the alcoholics we boarded seemed to get sober, some others had. With their wives, they crowded into our downstairs parlor. At once, I burst into the story of my opportunity. Never shall I forget their impassive faces and the steady gaze that they focused upon me. With waning enthusiasm, my tale trailed off to the end. There was a long silence. Almost timidly, one of my friends began to speak. We know how hard up you are, Bill. It bothers us a lot. We've often wondered what we might do about it, but I think I speak for everyone here when I say that what you now propose bothers us an awful lot more. The speaker's voice grew more confident. Don't you realize, he went on, that you can never become a professional? As generous as Charlie has been to us, don't you see that we can't tie this thing up with his hospital or any other? You tell us that Charlie's proposal is ethical. Sure, it's ethical, but what we've got won't run on ethics only. It has to be better. Sure, Charlie's idea is good, but it isn't good enough. This is a matter of life and death, Bill, and nothing but the very best will do. Challengingly, my friends looked at me as their spokesman continued. Bill, haven't you often said right here in this meeting that sometimes the good is the enemy of the best? Well, this is a plain case of it. You can't do this thing to us. So spoke the group conscience. The group was right, and I was wrong. The voice on the subway was not the voice of God. Here was the true voice welling up out of my friends. I listened, and thank God I obeyed. And here's something really, again, to me is Bill has showed a lot of humility in this sort of thing. If I, I got to kind of look at the history because someone might say, well, wasn't, wasn't he trying to dominate? If there was a lot of fear going on that this organization could still fold. And so Bill and Bob, they were the ones running the show. Uh, uh, but it's wonderful they were, they kind of always kind of hit me as saying, there's the old saying is, a lot can be accomplished if I don't care who gets the credit. It also tells me that just because I'm sober and things are just about all right, that I'll just sit on my laurels. And I'll go to a meeting, maybe a meeting or two a week and get a little active, maybe, maybe. It's the, the, and that's good, but it's the enemy of the best. And it's important too. If I believe this tradition that God, what's ever been decided upon, that's God's desire for that, for that meeting. I need to obey it. I may think it's wrong decision, but this tradition tells me God said to Paul, 
you know, you back this 100 plus percent. Don't criticize it. Don't argue with it. Be a uniter, not a divider. And an important aspect about the group conscience, while we're talking about tradition too, the group conscience is, is a quorum of the members of any individual group. And this speaks to why it's so important for us to participate in a home group. If the members of that group don't participate in the group conscience meetings, then there's really no group conscience. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is two or three people do all the work at the group level. And two or three people are the only people that show up for a group conscience. And then you can't really say that it's God's will being expressed because it's more just the two or three people who get together and have lunch once in a while together and decide that the meeting ought to run that way. So it's important for all of us in Alcoholics Anonymous to participate at the group level so that God's will can be expressed through the group conscience. Any questions about that or about the second tradition? Moving forward, Tradition 3, page 139. Tradition 3 starts off, it says, the only requirement for A membership is a desire to stop drinking. And I'd probably say this is the least understood tradition of all, wouldn't you, Paul? Well, it gets diluted maybe a little bit. Seems to be. Page 139, Tradition 3. This tradition is packed with meaning, for AA is really saying to every serious drinker, you are an AA member if you say so. You can declare yourself in. Nobody can keep you out. No matter who you are, no matter how low you've gone, no matter how grave your emotional complications, even your crimes, we still can't deny you AA. We don't want to keep you out. We aren't a bit afraid you'll harm us, never mind how twisted or violent you may be. We just want to be sure that you get the same great chance for sobriety that we've had. So you're an AA member the minute you declare yourself. Even if your name is Dave and you get in a fist fight with the other Dave in the hallway. That's right. You're still in. You're still in. To establish this principle of membership took years of harrowing experience. In our early time, nothing seemed so fragile, so easily breakable as an AA group. Hardly an alcoholic we approached paid any attention. Most of those who did join us were like flickering candles in a windstorm. Time after time, their uncertain flames blew out and couldn't be relighted. Our unspoken, constant thought was, which of us may be the next? A member gives us a vivid glance of those days. At one time, he says, every AA group had many membership rules. Everybody was scared witless that something or somebody would capsize the boat and dump us all back into the drink. Our foundation office asked each group to send in its list of protective regulations. The total list was a mile long. If all those rules had been in effect everywhere, nobody could have possibly joined AA at all. So great was the sum of our anxiety and fear. We were resolved to admit nobody to AA but that hypothetical class of people we termed pure alcoholics. Except for their guzzling and the unfortunate results thereof, they could have no other complications. So beggars, tramps, asylum inmates, prisoners, queers, plain crackpots, and fallen women were definitely out. Yes, sir, we'd cater only to pure and respectable alcoholics. Any others would surely destroy us. Besides, if we took in these odd ones, what would decent people say about us? We built a fine mesh fence right around AA. And it's said that when they first started with this tradition, that, that this was actually one of the incidents that brought Bill to the decision to do all the traditions. They sent out a request for each known AA group and said, send us your rules. And, uh, and they put all the rules together and figured out that even Bill Wilson himself would not have been admitted if they had all of these rules in place, which was ironic. And it is, it is a black eye. It's, it's true on, on the development of AA, but, you know, groups were segregated. You know, a good friend of ours tells a story about a segregated group he attended in, in Ohio. One, one of the third or fourth AA meetings ever started, um, I believe it was in Cleveland or Columbus. And uh, there were segregated meetings. Dr. Bob, it's been said, didn't want to let women in to begin with because he thought that would be problematic, which, you know, since men are incapable of controlling themselves, you could easily see why, but you would almost think that they would have said let AA be just for the women, and the men can fend for themselves. Um, they had a lot of rules, and, uh, and luckily, AA was way ahead of the curve at getting rid of those rules, and AA was far more advanced at integrating both through the, the different sexes as well as the different races, far more advanced than any other part of society was. 
Continue reading, please. Middle of page 140. Maybe this sounds comical now. Maybe you think we old-timers were pretty intolerant. But I can tell you there was nothing funny about the situation then. We were grim because we felt our lives and homes were threatened, and there was, this was no laughing matter. Intolerant, you say? Well, we were frightened. Naturally, we began to act like most everybody does when afraid. After all, isn't fear the true basis of intolerance? Yes, we were intolerant. How could we then guess that all those fears were to prove groundless? How could we know that thousands of these sometimes frightening people were to make astonishing recoveries and become our greatest workers and intimate friends? Was it credible that AA was to have a divorce rate far lower than average? Could we then foresee that troublesome people were to become our principal teachers of patience and tolerance? Could any then imagine a society which would include every conceivable kind of character and cut across every barrier of race, creed, politics, and language with ease? Why did AA finally drop all its membership regulations? Why did we leave it to each newcomer to decide himself whether he was an alcoholic and whether he should join us? Why did we dare to say, contrary to the experience of society and government everywhere, that we would neither punish nor deprive any AA of membership, that we must never compel anyone to pay anything, believe anything, or conform to anything? The answer, now seen in Tradition 3, was simplicity itself. At last, experience taught us that to take away any alcoholic's full chance was sometimes to pronounce his death sentence and often to condemn him to endless misery. Who dared to be judge, jury, and executioner of his own sick brother? And you'll notice in the middle of page 141 at the paragraph that previous to the one we just read, it says the same thing is repeated in the first tradition on the idea of unity, that no A membership, that we can never compel anyone to sit, pay anything, believe anything, or conform to anything. And they're just repeating the same idea again, that there's no bosses in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's so important for us to all understand that, that it's just not our job to be telling each other what to do. Continue, please. Page 141 as group. As group after group saw these possibilities, they finally abandoned all membership regulations. One dramatic experience after another clinched this determination until it became our tr universal tradition. Here are two examples. On the AA calendar, it was year two. In that time, nothing could be seen but two struggling nameless groups of alcoholics trying to hold their faces up to the light. A newcomer appeared at one of these groups, knocked on the door, and asked to be let in. He talked frankly with that group's oldest member. He soon proved that his was a desperate case and that, above all, he wanted to get well. But, he asked, will you let me join your group? Since I am the victim of another addiction, even worse stigmatized than alcoholism, you may not want me among you, or will you? There was the dilemma. What should the group do? The oldest member summoned two others and in confidence laid the explosive facts in their laps. Said he, well, what about it? If we turn this man away, he'll soon die. If we allow him in, only God knows what trouble he'll brew. What shall the answer be? Yes well, or no? What, uh, when I asked an AA historian just who, what this first, who this guy was, because it was a gentleman, and uh, he said, well, Paul, it's kind of lost to history. If you ask the Akron people, he was a heroin addict. If you ask the New York people, because that were the two groups, uh, he was a uh, transvestite. But let's read on, because then we see just because he was that, regardless of what he was, hey, we'll see how, how great he was within AA. At first, the elders could look only at the objections. We deal, they said, with alcoholics only. Shouldn't, shouldn't we sacrifice this one for the sake of the many? So went the discussion while the newcomer's fate hung in the balance. Then one of the three spoke in a very different voice. What we are really afraid of, he said, is our reputation. We are much more afraid of what people might say than the trouble this strange alcoholic might bring. As we've been talking, five short words have been running through my mind. Something keeps repeating to me. What would the master do? Not another word was said. What more indeed could be said? Could I just interject there? Every tradition, like almost every step, talks about one thing predominantly. And I, I'm not arguing humility is the basis of a lot of things. Fear, 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 fear. And where I got sober, they had a saying. When you're walking through the valley of fear, don't pitch a tent. Move. <laughs> Do something. Call a sponsor. Just don't pitch a tent. Thank you so much. Bottom of page 142. 
Overjoyed, the newcomer plunged into 12-step work. Tirelessly, he laid AA's message before scores of people. Since this was a very early group, those scores have since multiplied themselves into thousands. Never did he trouble anyone with his other difficulty. AA had taken its first step in the formation of Tradition 3. Could I, and now could I just bring this up? And this is where it's just a personal opinion of mine. I can dilute this tradition. Never did he trouble anyone with these other difficulties. And I had some other difficulties, and I go to other 12-step programs for those difficulties. But I leave those there. And while I'm in AA, I show respect for where I'm at, and I talk about my alcoholism. When I'm in the other 12-step programs, I don't talk about alcoholism. I talk about that particular thing that we're dealing with. Because if I do, am I going to unite him or divide it? So I would be doing a disservice to the group if I start talking about those other items. Top of page 143. Not long after the man with the double stigma knocked for admission, AA's other group received into its membership a salesman we shall call Ed. A power driver, this one, and brash as any salesman could possibly be. He had at least an idea a minute on how to improve AA. Not like any of us. <laughs> Ed, Ed the Blasphemer is probably my favorite story in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he sold uh, polish because Hank P. Uh, had started, a, Hank P. and Bill, had start, Bill Wilson had started a little company, and Ed was selling his polish. Yeah, so something that uh, I, th I think they even talk about in an AA Comes of Age. Yeah. When, when they first started Alcoholics Anonymous, they had lots of different business ideas. But Hank and Bill came up with all these ideas. So one of the ideas was a, a car polish, car wax company. So what they would do is people would write in to the central office, you know, I'm so-and-so, I live in Middleton, New York, and, you know, and I want to find out about AA. So they would keep this list of all these people that wrote in. And when somebody would get sober, if they lasted more than a week or two, they would give them a box of, shoe, of uh, car <laughs> polish, polish, and they would send them out to sell car polish, and they'd give them a list of towns to go to. And they'd give them a list of names in each of the towns, and they'd say, while you're there, sell that car polish and 12-step this guy. And that's how AA spread throughout the Northeast. And if you want to know, uh, Ed, Ed got into trouble while he was trying to sell polish in Boston. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Page 143, middle of the top paragraph. These ideas he sold to fellow members with the same burning enthusiasm with which he distributed automobile polish. But he had one idea that wasn't saleable. Ed was an atheist. His pet obsession was that AA could get along better without its God nonsense. He browbeat everybody, and everybody expected that he'd soon get drunk. For at the time, you see, AA was on the pious side. There must be a heavy penalty, it was thought, for blasphemy. Distressingly enough, Ed proceeded to stay sober. At length, the time came for him to speak in a meeting. We shivered, for we knew what was coming. He paid a fine tribute to the fellowship. He told how his family had been reunited. He extolled the virtue of honesty. He recalled the joys of 12-step work. And then he lowered the boom, cried Ed. I can't stand this God stuff. It's a lot of m malarkey for weak folks. This group doesn't need it, and I won't have it. To hell with it. A great wave of outraged resentment engulfed the meeting, sweeping every member to a single resolve. Out he goes. The elders led Ed aside. They said firmly, you can't talk like this around here. You'll have to quit it or get out. With great sarcasm, Ed came back at them. Now do tell. Is that so? He reached over to the bookshelf and took up a sheaf of papers. On top of them lay the foreword to the book Alcoholics Anonymous, then under preparation. He read aloud, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Relentlessly, Ed went on, when you guys wrote that sentence, did you mean it or didn't you? Dismayed, the elders looked at one another, for they knew he had them cold. So Ed stayed. Ed not only stayed, he stayed sober. Month after month, the longer he kept dry, the louder he talked against God. The group was in anguish so deep that all fraternal charity had vanished. When, oh when, groaned members to one another, will that guy get drunk? Quite a while later, Ed got a sales job, which took him out of town. At the end of a few days, the news came in. He'd send a telegram for money, and everybody knew what that meant. Then he got on the phone. In those days, we'd go anywhere on a 12-step job, no matter how unpromising. But this time, nobody stirred. 
Leave him alone. Let him try it by himself for once. Maybe he'll learn a lesson. About two weeks later, Ed stole by night into an AA member's house and, unknown to the family, went to bed. Daylight found the master of the house and another friend drinking their morning coffee. A noise was heard on the stairs. To their consternation, Ed appeared. A quizzical smile on his face, he said, "'Have you fellows had your morning meditation?' They quickly sensed that he was quite in earnest. In fragments, his story came out. In a neighboring state, Ed had holed up in a cheap hotel. After all his pleas for help had been rebuffed, these words rang in his fevered mind. "'They have deserted me. I have been deserted by my own kind. This is the end. Nothing is left.' As he tossed on his bed, his hand brushed the bureau nearby, touching a book. Opening the book, he read, It was a Gideon Bible. Ed never confided any more of what he saw and felt in that hotel room. It was the year 1938. He hasn't had a drink since. Nowadays, when old-timers who knew Ed foregather, who know Ed foregather, they exclaim, What if we had actually succeeded in throwing Ed out for blasphemy? What would have happened to him and all the others he later helped? So the hand of providence early gave us a sign that any alcoholic member, any alcoholic is a member of our society when he says so. Isn't that wonderful? But I kind of reversed that. What if they had gone up to Boston to give Ed money and that? Maybe he wouldn't have found a God of his understanding. Sometimes I have to have situations of desperation, if that's the word I want to use, because Ed then became even a better person. Than, than where he was because he said he was full of sarcasm. A, per, a man who's, if, when, if I'm full of sarcasm, what am I fer, fi, uh, full of? Fear. Fear. And if you don't believe me, I would just suggest you read page 37 and 38 out of Living Sober and see what it talks about what fear represents. Fear, fear, fear. And as Paul pointed out, in the chapter Working with Others, in the big book, it says that the moment we place our work with the newcomer on the service plane, he relies upon us to meet his needs is where we get in trouble because then he's got no chance of finding a relationship with a higher power. And As we're all aware, there's nothing that any of us do to get somebody else sober. The person has to find a relationship with a higher power. And on page 132 or 135 in the chapter to the wives, it says, if your husband has a relapse, it better be found out right away because either he's found God or he hasn't. And not to be confused, as they said earlier, with the idea that, you know, where AA started from, where people were a little on the pious side. And here in the South, we probably bump up against that sometimes, more often than not, maybe. Each person has to find a relationship with the power greater than themselves. And as the same thread runs through all the traditions that these were bred out of fear, the same tolerance is what the resolution was in the traditions. Each tradition talks about this idea that it's our job to be tolerant of each other. And each person believes what they believe, and that's okay. Any questions or comments on the third tradition? Moving forward into the fourth tradition, page 146. Each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Autonomy is a $10 word, but in relation to us, it means very simply that every AA group can manage its affairs exactly as it pleases, except when AA as a whole is threatened. Comes now the same question raised in Tradition 1. Isn't such, a liberty, isn't such liberty foolishly dangerous? Over the years, every conceivable deviation from our 12 steps and traditions has been tried. That was sure to be, since we are so largely a band of ego-driven individualists. Children of chaos, we have defiantly played with every brand of fire, only to emerge unharmed and, we think, wiser. These very deviations created a vast process of trial and error, which, under the grace of God, has brought us to where we stand today. When AA's traditions were first published in 1946, we had become sure that an AA group could stand almost any amount of battering. We saw that the group, exactly like the individual, must eventually conform to whatever tested principles would guarantee survival. We had discovered that there was perfect safety in the process of trial and error. So confident of this, we had become that the original statement of AA tradition carried the significant sentence, Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. 
This meant, of course, that we had been given the courage to declare each AA group an individual entity, strictly reliant on its own conscience as a guide to action. In charting this enormous expanse of freedom, we found it necessary to post only two storm signals. A group ought not do anything which would greatly injure AA as a whole, nor ought to affiliate itself with anything or anybody else. There would be real danger should we commence to call some groups wet, others dry, still others Republican or Communist, and yet others Catholic or Protestant. The AA group would have to stick to its course or be hopelessly lost. Sobriety had to be its sole objective. In all other respects, there was perfect freedom of will and action. Every group had the right to be wrong. And it's important to combine this tradition with the 10th tradition. And remember that it's a cinch that if we never argue these things privately, we'll never argue them publicly. It's just never a good idea privately to talk about one group or another group. If you don't like going to a meeting, go to a different meeting. But don't say to somebody else, oh, that meeting, I don't like that meeting, you know, they're... They're all Republicans over there, you know, because you may turn that person off and that may be the meeting that they really need to go to. And we never know when somebody's going to say something that changes the life of another. Do you really want to be the person that prevents that person from going to where they should go to say what they should say that may save another's life? Just best to keep our opinions to ourselves. Mary Catherine and I had a friend at a, a meeting we used to attend together it used to say, six billion Chinamen and me really don't give a shit about what you think. <laughs> one thing I'd like to just read this one statement out of it <clears throat> because it gives us some guidance. If I, if I have a problem just uh, because it says any group can do their own affairs, so long as it doesn't greatly hurt AA. So many times I may want to start a group, but I need to maybe go to someone who's been around a little bit and find out, does this. Now, there's a bit here when it says, when my plans to start another group or something concerns the welfare of neighboring groups. Now, that could be an existing group, but could affect the neighboring groups. Uh, I go to those groups, and they ought to be consulted. So... Uh, uh, if this was a group at 1 o'clock and I wanted to start a group uh, to, uh, just a block away, that's, that's close. I need to go to that group and, and say, you start at 1, we start at 1, is, is it all right? Now, you might say, well, why is that so? Say, well, I can get to a point where I diluted the group so much, we can't be self-supporting. So the groups go out of existence. And we don't adhere then to, to when we get to the seventh tradition. And Paul was reading from page 189 from the long form of the fourth tradition. And, uh, and yes, that's true that we do consult with other groups, but that shouldn't interfere with the third spiritual axiom in AA, which is that a resentment in a coffee pot starts most new AA <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Continue in the middle of page 147, please. When AA was still young, lots of eager groups were forming. In a town we'll call Middleton, a real Cracker Jack had started up. The townspeople were as hot as firecrackers about it. Stargazing, the elders dreamed of innovations. They figured the town needed a great big alcoholic center, a kind of pilot plant AA groups could duplicate everywhere. Beginning on the ground floor, there would be a club. In the second story, they would sober up drunks and hand them currency for their back debts. The third deck would house an educational project, quite non-controversial, of course. In imagination, the gleaming center was to go up several stories more, but three would do for a start. This would all take a lot of money, other people's money. Believe it or not, wealthy townsfolk bought the idea. There were, though, a few conservative dissenters among the alcoholics. They wrote the foundation, AA's headquarters in New York, wanting to know about this sort of streamlining. They understood that the elders, just to nail things down good, were about to apply to the foundation for a charter. These few were disturbed and skeptical. Of course, there was a promoter in the deal, a super promoter. By his eloquence, he allayed all fears despite advice from the foundation that it could issue no charter and that ventures which mix an AA group with medication and education had come to sticky ends elsewhere. To make things safer, the promoter organized three corporations and became president of them all. Freshly painted, the new center shone. The warmth of it all spread through town. Soon things began to hum. 
to ensure foolproof continuous operation, 61 rules and regulations were adopted. But alas, this bright scene was not long in darkening. Confusion replaced serenity. It was found that some drunks yearned for education but doubted if they were alcoholics. The personality defects of others could be cured, maybe with a loan. Some were club-minded, but it was just a question of taking care of the lonely heart. We've all met those folks. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been those folks. <laughs> Sometimes the swarming applicants would go for all three floors. Some would start at the top and come through to the bottom, becoming club members. Others started in the club, pitched a binge, were hospitalized, then graduated to education on the third floor. It was a beehive of activity, all right. But unlike a beehive, it was confusion compounded. An AA group as such simply couldn't handle this sort of project. All too late, that was discovered. Then came the inevitable explosion, something like the day the boiler burst in Wombly's clapboard factory. A chill choke damp of fear and frustration fell over the group. And now is where we get the introduction of the famous Rule 62 that I'm sure we're all familiar with. When that lived, a wonderful thing had happened. The head promoter wrote the foundation office. He said he wished he'd paid some attention to AA experience. Then he did something else that was to become an AA classic. It all went on a little card about, a golf, about golf score size. The cover read, Middleton Group Number 1, Rule Number 62. Once the card was unfolded, a single pungent sentence leaped to the eye. Don't take yourself too damn seriously. Thus, it was that under Tradition 4, an AA group had exercised its right to be wrong. Moreover, it had performed a great service for Alcoholics Anonymous because it had been humbly willing to apply the lessons it learned. It had picked itself up with a laugh and gone on to better things. Even the chief architect standing in the ruins of his dream could laugh at himself. And that is the very acme of humility. I know this is going to be other ways, but if you look at the schedule in the Atlanta office there, it says what AA does not do. And it's important. I'm talking about the AA group does not do. We're, we, we're not a financial organization. I'm not going to read them all, but we, we do not furnish motivative uh, s seminars and require people to come into AA. We do not start religious or spiritual organizations. We do not have bake sales or garage sales to say this is AA to make money. It's, it's not bad to kind of look at what AA does not do. The individual may do some of that. AA doesn't lend money. AA doesn't provide a place for you to stay. AA doesn't take your paycheck and say, we're going to help other ones live, live that way. We're going to pass this money for those that are less fortunate on the money. And uh, I've just, and we have to have those rules for good purpose. Because if, uh, I heard uh, Smitty, that was Dr. Bob's son, talk about some of this AA groups were getting involved in. And it hurt AA. Because people were confused, were we AA or were we something else? It's also important to remember that this tradition applies directly into our day-to-day -day lives and how we interact with each other in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and with our sponsees in particular. My sponsor pointed out when I was uh, very young in sobriety that if you weren't very good at managing your own life, what makes you think you're qualified to manage the lives of others? And uh, sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a lot of people that have lots of opinions about how other people should be doing things. And sometimes, even though this may seem shocking, some of us can be a little on the controlling side. <laughs> I know, shocking. It's not our job to manage our friend's money. It's not our job to manage other people's sobriety. If you're sponsoring someone, it's not your job to manage their life. Suggest that they find a relationship with a higher power just like you did that's going to be their solution. Moving forward, Tradition 5, page 150. Top of the page, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Shoemaker, stick to thy last. Better do one thing supremely well than many badly. That is the central theme of this tradition. Around it, our society gathers in unity. The very life of our fellowship requires the preservation of this principle. Alcoholics Anonymous can be likened to a group of physicians who might find a cure for cancer and upon whose concerted work would depend the answer for sufferers of this disease. 
True, every physician in such a group might have his own specialty. Every doctor concerned would at times wish he could devote himself to his chosen field rather than work only with the group. But once these men had hit upon a cure, once it had become apparent that only by their united effort could this be accomplished, then all of them would feel bound to devote themselves solely to the relief of cancer. In the radiance of such a miraculous discovery, any doctor would set his other ambitions aside at whatever personal cost. Just as firmly bound by obligation are the members of Alcoholics Anonymous who have demonstrated that they can help problem drinkers as others seldom can. The unique ability of each AA to identify himself with and bring recovery to the newcomer in no way depends upon his learning, eloquence, or on any special individual skills. The only thing that matters is that he is an alcoholic who has found a key to sobriety. These legacies of suffering and of recovery are easily passed among alcoholics, one to the other. This is our gift from God, and its bestowal upon others like us is the one aim that today animates AAs all around the globe. And it's important to understand that there, there are no skill sets that make one person better at 12-step work than another. We're all qualified to do 12-step work, every single one of us. The reason why we do the 12-step work is it's our mission. It's what we're, we're given to do. We've been given this message freely, and we carry it freely to others. And all of us are qualified to do 12-step work. No amount of sobriety required. If I had trouble with whiskey, yo, know, then I can carry that message like no one else can. What about vodka? What if you're Oh, I never sank so low as to <laughs> drink vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but you could do 12-step work. But I could still do 12-step yeah. work. Hey. Because we're told in the doctor's opinion that, th that, that that's the identification. And without that identification, uh, it doesn't ring bell. What, when, what, what made Dr. Bob listen and said, oh, my God, what did he say? I'm talking to a man who knew what he was talking about. And it went from the intellect into the gut. The intellect's fine. I do better when I know better. But I got to get it in my gut. That's why we have these other 12-step programs, because I, I, I identify with that, that particular item, and it's, and it's very important. I think, too, a key word here to look at, if I may, please, it's carry its message. So some messages may be liter uh, 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 literature-based. Some may be discussion. Some may be speaker-type meetings. There's a variety of meetings that in AA we're very blessed with. So it's important that I, I don't criticize any particular meeting again. I was brought up when I first got in for that first two or three years. He said, make half your meetings speaker meetings. And the other half, preferably literature-based meetings. So that I get some knowledge about what, what we're doing here. But by a speaker meeting now, I get to where someone came dragging in and look how the uh, 12 steps and the traditions help this man or woman improve their lives. I get to see the full picture. Less, less opportunity for you to share in those meetings also. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Top of page 151. There is another reason for this singleness of purpose. It is the great paradox of AA that we know we can seldom keep the precious gift of sobriety unless we give it away. If a group of doctors possessed a cancer cure, they might be conscience-stricken if they failed their mission through self-seeking. Yet such a failure wouldn't jeopardize their personal survival. For us, if we neglect those who are still sick, there is unremitting danger to our own lives and sanity. Under these compulsions of self-preservation, duty, and love, it is not strange that our society has concluded that it has but one high mission, to carry the AA message to those who don't know there's a way out. Highlighting the wisdom of AA's single purpose, a member tells this story. Restless one day, I felt I'd better do some 12-step work. Maybe I should take out some insurance against a slip. But first, I'd have to find a drunk to work on. So I hopped the subway to Towns Hospital, where I asked Dr. Silkworth if he had a prospect. Nothing too promising, the little doc said. There's just one chap on the third floor who might be a possibility. But he's an awfully tough Irishman. I never saw a man so obstinate. He shouts that if his partner would treat him better and his wife would leave him alone, he'd soon solve his alcohol problem. He's had a bad case of DTs, he's pretty foggy, and he's very suspicious of everybody. 
Doesn't sound too good, does it? But working with him may do something for you, so why don't you have a go at it? I was soon sitting beside a big hulk of a man, decidedly unfriendly. He stared at me out of eyes which were slits in his red and swollen face. I had to agree with the doctor. He certainly didn't look good. But I told him my own story. I explained what a wonderful fellowship we had, how well we understood each other. I bore down hard on the hopelessness of the drunk's dilemma. I insisted that few drunks could ever get well on their own steam, but that in our groups we could do together what we could not do separately. He interrupted to scoff at this and asserted he'd fix his wife, his partner, and his alcoholism, alcoholism by himself. Sarcastically, he asked, how much does your scheme cost? I was thankful I could tell him nothing at all. His next question, what are you getting out of it? Of course, my answer was my own sobriety and a mighty happy life. Still dubious, he demanded, do you really mean the only reason you are here is to try and help me and to help yourself? Yes, I said, that's absolutely all there is to it. There's no angle. Then, hesitantly, I ventured to talk about the spiritual side of our program. What a freeze that drunk gave me. I'd no sooner got the word spiritual out of my mouth than he pounced. Oh, he said, now I get it. You're proselytizing. You're proselyting, proselyting for some damn religious sect or another. Where do you get that no angle stuff? I belong to a great church that means everything to me. You've got a nerve to come in here talking religion. Thank heaven I came up with the right answer for that one. It was based four square on the single purpose of AA. You have faith, I said, perhaps far deeper faith than mine. No doubt you're better taught in religious matters than I. So I can't tell you anything about religion. I don't even want to try. I'll bet, too, that you could give me a letter-perfect definition of humility. But from what you've told me about yourself and your problems, I and how you propose to lick them, I think I know what's wrong. Okay, he said, give me the business. Well, said I, I think you've ju you're just a conceited Irishman who thinks he can run the whole show. This really shocked him. But as he calmed down, he began to listen while I tried to show him that humility was the main key to sobriety. Finally, he saw that I wasn't attempting to change his religious views, that I wanted him to find the grace in his own religion that would aid his recovery. From there on, we got along fine. Now, concludes this old timer, suppose I'd been obliged to talk to this man on religious grounds. Suppose my answer had to be that AA needed a lot of money, that AA went in for education, hospitals, and rehabilitation. Suppose I'd suggested that I'd take a hand in his domestic and business affairs. Where would we have wound up? No place, of course. Years later, this tough Irish customer liked to say, my sponsor sold me on one idea, and that was sobriety. At the time, I couldn't have bought anything else. Bill call it our high mission, our high mission, and then to me that's a that's an important thing to understand. It's it's a high mission with me. AA is an avocation, not a vocation. That's true, but I have a high mission. I have a duty. I have a responsibility to carry that mission and to pass it on. God saved me from alcoholism. Surely I owe a little time to another alcoholic to to share my experience. And then he goes on to say, but no group that in our groups we could get together, we can do what, as a group that what we can't do separately. And again, that's, I carry the message. And when I'm talking to an alcoholic, I like to keep emphasizing this is what I'm here for, for alcoholism. I'm not here for anything else. I may fancy myself as an expert in a lot of things, which I'm absolutely not. But uh, that big shotism creeps in. I've got to stick to what I know, and I know really, really good. I know how to drink whiskey, and I know now a way to, to relieve that obsession from the bottle. And Paul mentioned on page 180 or 181 in the big book where Dr. Bob tells a story, and he says that when he met Bill Wilson, that he was the first living human being with whom he had spoke who knew anything about alcoholism from his experience. And that's the message that we try to carry through the fifth tradition in, in each group. And each meeting that we attend, we remember that there's one purpose that we have. That's to help the still-suffering alcoholic. The still-suffering alcoholic isn't me because I'm disappointed, upset, disillusioned, or whatever the case may be. The still-suffering alcoholic is the person who can't stop drinking. Now I think we've reached the second spiritual axiom, unless somebody's got a comment or a question on the fifth tradition. Please, Smitty. 
I'm Smitty. I'm an alcoholic. Smitty. Uh, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to uh, share with a family friend my alcoholism and my subsequent recovery. And uh, he was having some real hard times with, his, with, with alcoholism. And, and as much as I wanted to share with him about my recovery and just how I knew AA could really uh, help him, uh, it wasn't until I got him to an AA meeting. You know, I took him to an AA meeting. And he was just blown away by the hospitality, if you want to call it that, the AA clubhouse and uh, the people who came with no agenda. He wasn't pressured. He wasn't, you know, and he was allowed to talk at his own pace. And that guy now has been sober for a number of years just because of what he experienced in that particular clubhouse and them fulfilling what their purpose was. And they did all the work. I didn't have to do anything but share my story as best I could you know, agree to take him to a meeting with me, and the AA membership did the rest of the work. And it was just amazing. And I, and I always think about that when I have an opportunity to sit and listen about that fifth tradition. Thanks, Smitty. And, and what Smitty said is so important, and we just read it in the fifth tradition. When there's a newcomer at the meeting, we don't talk about our spiritual experience. We don't talk about our religious beliefs. We talk about the hopelessness of alcoholism based on our experience. That's how we carry the AA message. The AA message is that alcoholism is an incurable disease. It's got a physical compulsion to drink alcohol. Once we drink, the allergy is tripped. Coupled with the physical compulsion is a mental obsession. It's somehow, some way, I'll be able to drink normally. The solution that AA has to offer is a spiritual solution. That's the AA message. I think we've reached the second spiritual axiom, which Paul will explain. You won't find it in this book or any other AA literature. Uh, we are fixing to adhere to, we have some more traditions to go through, but we are fixing to adhere to the second spiritual axiom of AA. You're all familiar with the first, which is in the 10th step of the 12 and 12, which said, if I am disturbed, no matter what the cause, the problem rests with me. Something to that effect. However, the second spiritual axiom, though not in any AA literature that I'm aware of, is extremely important. So we're fixing to adhere to it. And it goes like this. The mind cannot absorb what the butt cannot endure. We're going to break for 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and finish the rest of the traditions. Welcome back, everybody. Moving forward, back on page 155, Tradition 6 says, An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. The moment we saw that we had an answer for alcoholism, it was reasonable, or so it seemed at the time, for us to feel that we might have the answer to a lot of other things. The AA groups, many thought, could go into business, might finance any enterprise, whatever, in the total field of alcoholism. In fact, we felt duty-bound to throw the whole weight of the AA name behind any meritorious cause. Here are some of the things we dreamed. Hospitals didn't like alcoholics, so we thought we'd build a hospital chain of our own. People needed to be told what alcoholism was, so we'd educate the public, even rewrite school and medical textbooks. We'd gather up derelicts from skid rows, sort out those who could get well, and make it possible for the rest to earn their livelihood in a kind of quarantined confinement. Maybe these places would make large sums of money to carry on our other good works. We seriously thought of rewriting the laws of the land and having it declared that alcoholics are sick people. No more would they be jailed. Judges, judges would parole them in our custody. We'd spill AA into the dark regions of dope addiction and criminality. We'd form groups of depressive and paranoid folks. The deeper the neurosis, the better we'd like it. It stood to reason that if alcoholism could be licked, so could any problem. It occurred to us that we could take what we had into the factories, what we had into the factories, and cause laborers and capitalists to love each other. Our uncompromising honesty might soon clean up politics. With one arm around the shoulder of religion and the other around the shoulder of medicine, we'd resolve their differences. Having learned to live so happily, we'd show everybody else how. Why we thought our Society of Alcoholics Anonymous might prove to be the spearhead of a new spiritual advance. We might transform the world. Yes, we of AA did dream those dreams. How natural that was, since most alcoholics are bankrupt idealists. Nearly every one of us had wished to do great good, perform great deeds, and embody great ideals. We are all perfectionists who, failing perfection, have gone to the other extreme and settled for the bottle and the blackout. 
Providence, through AA, had brought us within reach of our highest expectations, so why shouldn't we share our way of life with everyone? Whereupon we tried AA hospitals. They all bogged down because you cannot put an AA group into business. Too many busybody cooks spoil the broth. AA groups had their fling at education, and when they began to publicly whoop up the merits of this or that brand, people became confused. Did AA fix drunks, or was it an educational project? Was AA spiritual, or was it medical? Was it a reform movement? In consternation, we saw ourselves getting married to all kinds of enterprises, some good and some not so good. Watching alcoholics committed willy-nilly to prisons or asylums, we began to cry, there ought to be a law. AAs commenced to thump tables in legislative committee rooms and agitated for legal reform. That made good newspaper copy, but little else. We saw we'd soon be mired in politics. Even inside AA, we found it imperative to remove the AA name from clubs and 12-step houses. The clubhouses are independent organizations. They're not affiliated in any way with Alcoholics Anonymous. However, it's suggested to the clubhouses that they try to conform to the spirit of the traditions And the closer they conform to the spirit of the traditions, the less friction or less chance there is for friction between the clubhouse and the AA group itself. But each meeting at a clubhouse is an independent AA group. So, for instance, here in Atlanta, we've got the Triangle Club. And the Triangle Club has a 7.30 a.m. meeting. Then there's a noon meeting. Then there's a 4 o'clock meeting. There's a 5.45 meeting. Then you've got the uh, 8 o'clock meeting. And uh, even though all those groups may refer to themselves at the Triangle Club, they're independent groups. They have a group conscience. They all run. They do their own things. The club itself runs its own business. It collects rent from the groups. The meetings are there. They're not affiliated with the club. Because what can happen then? A club can kick you out of the premises. And this It happened about a year ago. When the gentleman was kicked out and I heard someone was kicked out of a club, he he told me why, and I thought, well, I can understand. But he thought that was AA, and it violated the traditions. In AA history, before AA was organized, about 100 years before AA started, there was a group called the Washingtonian Society, which we'll talk about. The Washingtonian Society had a solution for alcoholism. They had 100,000-plus members, but they got sidetracked by abolition to start with, and then they moved on to start trying to fight for prohibition. And uh, unfortunately, it went by the wayside. Just 50 years after they were gone, they were all but forgot. And when Alcoholics Anonymous started, nobody even said, oh, you know, that's like the Washingtonian group, because nobody knew about them. They got that sidetracked. Continue, please. Middle of page 157. These adventures implanted a deep-rooted conviction that in no circumstances could we endorse any related enterprises, no matter how good. We of Alcoholics Anonymous could not be all things to all men, nor should we try. Years ago, this principle of no endorsement was put to a vital test. Some of the great distilling companies proposed to go into the field of alcohol education. It would be a good thing, they believed, for the liquor trade to show a sense of public responsibility. They wanted to say that liquor should be enjoyed, not misused. Hard drinkers ought to slow down, and problem drinkers, alcoholics, should not drink at all. In one of their trade associations, the question arose of just how this campaign should be handled. Of course, they would use the resources of radio, press, and films to make their point. But what kind of person should have the job? They immediately thought of Alcoholics Anonymous. If they could find a good public relations man in our ranks, why wouldn't he be ideal? He'd certainly know the problem. His connection with AA would be valuable because the fellowship stood high in public favor and hadn't an enemy in the world. Soon, they'd spotted their man, an AA with the necessary experience. Straight away, he appeared at New York's AA headquarters asking, Is there anything in our tradition that suggests I shouldn't take a job like this one? The kind of education seems good to me, and it is not too controversial. Do you headquarters, do you headquarters folks see any bugs in it? At first glance, it did look like a good thing. Then doubt crept in. The association wanted to use our member's full name in all its advertising. He was to be described both as its director of publicity and as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Of course, there couldn't be the slightest objection if such an association hired an AA member solely because of his public relations ability and his knowledge of alcoholism. But that wasn't the whole story. 
For in this case, not only was an AA member to break his anonymity at a public level, he was to link the name Alcoholics Anonymous to this particular educational project in the minds of millions. It would be bound to appear that AA was now backing education, liquor trade association style. And in the beginning of AA, there was a baseball player, I believe he played for the Cleveland Indians, and uh, and he sobered up, and everybody was just thrilled that AA would make a difference in this guy's life. So he paraded all around and announced himself as an alcoholic and member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that worked great until he got drunk. And then everybody looked at him and said, that AA business doesn't work. And it's good to look at this, too, if I may. Our problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. And as an individual, I can get so involved and so caught up in money and the prestige that I forget to go to meetings or that I, that I don't have time to help that alcoholic you know, who's suffering, whoever it would be, or I don't have time to talk to my sponsor because I need to make more money or I've got to feather my own cap through some prestigious type of organization. You are fairly renowned also. So oh, get out of here. But, I, but I, I'm just saying, I, when I keep personalizing them too, I have to, in other words, I have to look at my life. And that's why it's important that I have a sponsor who is able to say, Paul, maybe we're getting off the trail a little bit here. Continue, please. 158. The minute we saw this compromising fact for what it was, we asked the prospective publicity director how he felt about it. Great guns, he said. Of course I can't take the job. The ink wouldn't be dry on the first ad before an awful shriek would go up from a dry camp. They'd be out with lanterns looking for an honest AA to plump for their brand of education. AA would land exactly in the middle of the wet-dry controversy. Half the people in this country would think we'd signed up with the dries. The other half would think we'd joined the wets. What a mess. Nevertheless, we pointed out, you still have a legal right to take this job. I know that, he said, but this is no time for legalities. Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life, and it comes first. I certainly won't be the guy to land AA in big-time trouble, and this would really do it. Concerning endorsements, our friend had said it all. We saw as never before that we could not lend the AA name to any cause other than our own. One point in the past, I served on the board for a uh, local clubhouse, and the question was, should we announce membership in the clubhouse at the meetings there at the clubhouse? Because if we could draw membership up at this clubhouse, then the club itself would be able to better subsidize its operating expenses through membership, more money in the basket would go up the ladder to AA. It just seemed to really be a great idea. But some people had doubts, so we wrote the central office, general service office, rather, in New York City. And, it, and to note, New York City isn't Mecca. They're not in charge. They just happen to be the guys that know the most. So we wrote them, asked them what they thought about the idea, and they wrote back. And whenever you write the general service office, they'll start their letter and return to you with the statement. Of course, you're free to do whatever you'd like. But AA experience shows... You should know that when your sponsor starts off saying like that, that's because what you're thinking of doing is wrong. So they said AA experience shows that it's best not to endorse any related issue, no matter what, no matter how good the cause. And they said something very important. They said, if you're going to allow, or the meeting itself, the group is going to allow you to announce the AA clubhouse there, they have to allow anybody else to announce any other enterprise, whether they agree with it or not. If a group met at a church, they would have to make the church announcements, which obviously that would be a conflict of interest for us. So no outside issues, no matter how good they are, come to bear in Alcoholics Anonymous. The good can be the enemy of the best. I don't want to forget that. Any questions or comments on the sixth tradition? Moving forward into the seventh tradition on page 160. Every A group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. And the folks in New York, when I was at the Southeast uh, Regional Workshop, the folks from New York came down and they said, the basket is the only place in Alcoholics Anonymous where we think money and spirituality can mix. Because it's truly giving when you put your money in the basket. You don't know where it's going to go and who it's going to help. So there's very little ego involved in it. Tradition 7, page 160. Self-supporting alcoholics? Who ever heard of such a thing? Yet we find that's what we have to be. 
This principle is telling evidence of the profound change that AA has wrought in all of us. Everybody knows that active alcoholics scream that they have no troubles money can't cure. Always we've had our hands out. Time out of mind, we've been dependent upon somebody, usually money-wise. When a society composed entirely of alcoholics says it's going to pay its bills, that's really news. Probably no AA tradition had the labor pains this one did. In early times, we were all broke. When you add to this the habitual supposition that people ought to give money to alcoholics trying to stay sober, it can be understood why we thought we deserved a pile of folding money. What great things AA would be able to do with it. But oddly enough, people who had money thought otherwise. They figured that it was high time we now, sober, paid our own way. So our fellowship stayed poor because it had to. And in the beginning of AA, the the Rockefeller family took an interest in Alcoholics Anonymous because they saw it really making a difference, and they were philanthropists. So they had a dinner for, for AA where Bill Wilson and a couple of the other original members went and told their stories, and you could call it the grace of God or uh, just plain good fortune. But what the Rockefeller advisor who followed Bill Wilson around for, for a short period of time came back and reported was that if we give these people money, it'll ruin them. So instead of giving AA a bunch of money, what they decided to do was give a small monthly stipend. But that was it. That was the genius of the seventh tradition and where it started to come from. Bottom of page 160. There was another reason for our collective poverty. It was soon apparent that while alcoholics would spend lavishly on 12-step cases, they had a terrific aversion to dropping money into a meeting place hat for group purposes. We were astounded to find that we were as tight as the bark on a tree. So AA, the movement, started and stayed broke while its individual members waxed prosperous. Alcoholics are certainly all-or-nothing people. Our reactions to money prove this. As AA emerged from its infancy into adolescence, we swung from the idea that we needed vast sums of money to the notion that AA shouldn't have any. On every lip were the words, You can't mix AA and money. We shall have to separate the spiritual from the material. We took this violent new tack because here and there members had tried to make money out of their AA connections and we feared we'd be exploited. Now and then, grateful benefactors had endowed clubhouses, and as a result, there was sometimes outside interference in our affairs. We had been presented with a hospital, and almost immediately the donor's son became its principal patient and would-be manager. One AA group was given $5,000 to do with it what it would. The hassle over that chunk of money played havoc for years. Frightened by these complications, some groups refused to have a cent in their treasuries. Despite these misgivings, we had to recognize the fact that AA had to function. Meeting places cost something. To save whole areas from turmoil, small offices had to be set up, telephones installed, and a few full-time secretaries hired. Over many protests, these things were accomplished. We saw that if it weren't, the man coming in the door couldn't get a break. These simple services would require small sums of money, which we could and would pay ourselves. At last, the pendulum stopped swinging and pointed straight at Tradition 7 as it reads today. In this connection, Bill likes to tell the following pointed story. He explains that when Jack Alexander's Saturday Evening Post piece broke in 1941, thousands of frantic letters from distraught alcoholics and their families hit the foundation letterbox in New York. Our office staff, Bill says, consisted of two people, one devoted secretary and myself. How could this landslide of appeals be met? We'd have to have some more full-time help, that was for sure. So we asked the AA groups for voluntary contributions. Would they send us a dollar a member a year? Otherwise, this heartbreaking mail would have to go unanswered. To my surprise, the response of the groups was slow. I got mighty sore about it. Looking at this avalanche of mail one morning at the office, I paced up and down, ranting how irresponsible and tightwad my fellow members were. Just then, an old acquaintance stuck a tousled and aching head in the door. He was our prize slippy. I could see he had an awful hangover. Remembering some of my own, my heart filled with pity. I motioned him to my inside cubicle and produced a $5 bill. As my total income was $30 a week at the time, this was a fairly large donation. Lois really needed the money for groceries, but that didn't stop me. The intense relief on my friend's face warmed my heart. I felt especially virtuous as I thought of all the ex-drunks who wouldn't even send the foundation a dollar apiece, and here I was gladly making a $5 investment to fix a hangover. 
The meeting that night was at New York's old 24th Street Clubhouse. During the intermission, the treasurer gave a timid talk on how broke the group was. Club was. That was in the period when you couldn't mix money and AA. But finally he said it. The landlord would put us out if we didn't pay up. He concluded his remarks by saying, Now, boys, please go heavier on the hat tonight, will you? I heard all this quite plainly as I was piously trying to convert a newcomer who sat next to me. The hat came in my direction and I reached into my pocket. Still working on my prospect, I fumbled and came up with a 50-cent piece. Somehow it looked like a very big coin. Hastily, I dropped it back and fished out a dime, which clinked thinly as I dropped it in the hat. Hats never got folding money in those days. Then I woke up. I, who had boasted my generosity that morning, was treating my own club worse than the distant alcoholics who had forgotten to send the foundation their dollars. I realized that my $5 gift to the slippy was an ego-feeding proposition, bad for him and bad for me. There was a place in AA where spirituality and money would mix, and that was in the hat. There is another story about money. One night in 1948, the trustees of the foundation were having their quarterly meeting. The agenda discussion included a very important question. A certain lady had died. When her will was read, it was discovered that she had left Alcoholics Anonymous in trust with the Alcoholic Foundation a sum of $10,000. The question was, should AA take the gift? What a debate we had on that one. The foundation was really hard up just then. The groups weren't sending in enough for the support of the office. We had been tossing in all the book income, and even that hadn't been enough. The reserve was melting like snow in springtime. We needed that $10,000. Maybe, some said, the groups will never fully support the office. We can't let it shut down. It's far too vital. Yes, let's take the money. Let's take all such donations in the future. We're going to need them. Then came the opposition. They pointed out that the foundation board already knew of a total of half a million dollars set aside for AA and the wills of people still alive. Heaven only knew how much there was we hadn't heard of. If outside do donations weren't declined, absolutely cut off, then the foundation would one day become rich. Moreover, at the slightest intimation to this general public from our trustees that we needed money, we could become immensely rich. Compared to this prospect, prospect the $10,000 under consideration wasn't much, but like the alcoholic's first drink it would, if taken, inevitably set up a disastrous chain reaction. Where would that land us? Whoever pays the piper is apt to call the tune, and if the AA Foundation obtained money from outside sources, its trustees might be tempted to run things without reference to the wishes of AA as a whole. Relieved of responsibility, every alcoholic would shrug and say, Oh, the Foundation is really wealthy. Why should I bother? The pressure of that fat treasury would surely tempt the board to invent all kinds of schemes to do good with such funds, and so divert AA from its primary purpose. The moment that happened, our fellowship's confidence would be shaken. The board would be isolated and would fall under heavy attack of criticism, criticism from both AA and the public. These were the possibilities, pro and con. Then our trustees wrote a bright page of AA history. They declared for the principle that AA must always stay poor. Bare running expenses plus a prudent reserve would henceforth be the foundation's financial policy. Difficult as it was, they officially declined that $10,000 and adopted a formal, airtight resolution that all such future gifts would be similarly declined. At that moment, we believe, the principle of corporate poverty was firmly and finally embedded in AA tradition. This is a tradition that, from my point of view, it kind of starts out kind of simple. Am I going to quit being a taker and start being a giver? Because romance and finance get very, very prominent in, in a lot of people's lives, including myself. I don't argue that. And I was brought up, it's just the way I was initially told, when the basket goes around, if all you can afford is a nickel, you put a nickel in. Quit being a taker all the time. Start being a giver. Now, if you're absolutely can't, I understand that, and I think most people will. But maybe I need to deny myself going out to eat so I can contribute just a little bit to the kitty here. This was a great tradition for me. I, had a, I was a compulsive buyer, and uh, I did all right, and then I got sober. And I mean, oh, I mean, I really bought them. 
but I wasn't drinking so much, so I was taking that time up buying. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> All I know is I was using 23 credit cards. That's how you really do it upright. <laughs> well, I'm sitting here in AA, and they're saying, you know, uh, we ought to be fully self-supporting. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm not fully self-supporting. Who's supporting me? Visa, MasterCard. <laughs> Are you getting the drift? I need a prudent reserve. I need to have an emergency type of thing. Well, why? If for no other reason, it, it, it eliminates the fear. I've got 500 or or 1000 or 2000 dollars. So if I need new tires, I have the money for that. Whatever that may be. It also tells me something else. Be responsible. And some people I understand cannot, but I need to take care of my own uh, responsibilities. That may be health or uh, retirement, whatever it would be. And the general service office in in New York, where everything kind of comes out of, literature-wise, the grapevine, everything, they operate with a two-month prudent reserve operating budget. And that's it. They don't go over that. No more, no less. Continue, please. Page 165, last paragraph. When these facts were printed, there was a profound reaction. To people familiar with endless drives for charitable funds, AA presented a strange and refreshing spectacle. Approving editorials here and abroad generated a wave of confidence in the integrity of Alcoholics Anonymous. They pointed out that the irresponsible had become responsible and that by making financial independence part of its tradition, Alcoholics Anonymous had revived an ideal that its era had almost forgotten. Moving forward, Tradition 8. And once again, in this tradition, we're going to skip a couple of paragraphs. Tradition 8 starts, it says, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. And we're going to start at the bottom of page 166, where it says, despite this certainty... Despite the certainty, it is nevertheless true that few subjects have been the cause of more contention within our fellowship than professionalism. Caretakers who swept floors, cooks who fried hamburgers, secretaries in offices, authors writing books, all these we have seen hotly assailed because they were, as their critics angrily remarked, making money out of AA. Ignoring the fact that these labors were not 12-step jobs at all, the critics attacked as AA professionals these AA professionals, these workers of ours, who were often doing thankless tasks that no one else could or would do. Even greater furors were provoked when AA members began to run rest homes and farms for alcoholics, when some hired out to corporations as personnel men in charge of the alcoholic problem in industry, when some became nurses on alcoholic wards, when others entered the field of alcohol education. In all these instances and more, it was claimed that AA knowledge and experience were being sold for money. Hence, these people, too, were professionals. At last, however, a plain line of cleavage could be seen between professionalism and non-professionalism. When we had agreed that the 12th step couldn't be sold for money, we had been wise. But when we had declared that our fellowship couldn't hire service workers, nor could any AA member carry our knowledge into other fields, we were taking the counsel of fear. Fear which today has been largely dispelled in the light of experience. And we're going to skip over to page 169 in the middle of the page, where it starts, perhaps the fear will. Perhaps the fear will always lurk in every AA heart that one day our name will be exploited by somebody for real cash. Even the suggestion of such a thing never fails to whip up a hurricane. And we have discovered that hurricanes have a way of mauling with equal severity both the just and the unjust. They are always unreasonable. No individuals have been more buffeted by such emotional gusts than those AAs bold enough to accept employment with outside agencies dealing with the alcohol problem. A university wanted an AA member to educate the public on alcoholism. A corporation wanted a personnel man familiar with the subject. A state drunk farm wanted a manager who could really handle inebriates. A city wanted an experienced social worker who understood what alcohol could do to a family. A state alcohol commission wanted a paid researcher. These are only a few of the jobs which AA members as individuals have been asked to fill. Now and then, AA members have bought farms or rest homes where badly beat up topers could find needed care. The question was, and sometimes still is, 
Are such activities to be branded as professionalism under AA tradition? It's unfortunate, but more so in the beginning and, and less so now, thank God, that uh, people who did work with other alcoholics were often looked at as a necessary evil. And it was thought that alcoholics shouldn't go to work for treatment centers and shouldn't go to work in places where somehow their 12-step knowledge might come to benefit others and they'd get a salary out of it. And luckily, we've dispelled most of that. Skipping over to page 171 at the top of the page, it's significant now. It is significant now that almost no AA in our fellowship breaks anonymity at the public level, that nearly all these fears have subsided. We see that we have no right or need to discourage AAs who wish to work as individuals in these wider fields. It would actually be, it would be actually antisocial were we to forbid them. We cannot declare AA such a closed corporation that we keep our knowledge and experience top secret. If an AA member acting as a citizen can become a better researcher, educator, personnel officer, then why not? Everybody gains, and we have lost nothing. True, some of the projects to which AAs have attached themselves have been ill-conceived, but that makes not the slightest difference with the principle involved. Just ask anybody that opened a halfway house. <laughs> <laughs> This is the exciting welter of events which has finally cast up AA's tradition of non-professionalism. Our twelfth step is never to be paid for, but those who labor in service for us are worthy of their hire. So it's real short to me. If, if I've asked someone to help me take me through the steps and they want money, that's not AA. It's just that, it's just that simple. What if, what if you ask them to mow your yard? Is that okay? Uh, uh, I wouldn't mind if they did that. However, it's not AA. I shouldn't ask, I shouldn't ask anyone to do any, any uh, uh, favor that's directly connected to AA. There's a lot of this connection that if I help you, then you've got to do this for me. And I keep a scoreboard on that type of thing. And, it, and I, I find out once I do that, it does nothing but build resentments. That's all it does. Don't let them buy you coffee. Don't let them buy you dinner. You're not getting paid by them to be there. Twelve-step work is altruistic in the context that, that Alcoholics Anonymous uses the word to give of yourself without the expectation of compensation in any way, shape, or form. We benefit more from doing 12-step work than anybody we could ever do it with. Don't date them. That's a bad idea, too. <laughs> we have another tradition for that. That's outside of this book. Yeah, we're not going to get into that one no, today. We're not gonna get don't date them and don't let them pay for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Please, Marilyn. Is it okay if I'm cleaning house to give a lot of things to a sponsee who has nothing? Is that okay? I would say it's okay. It's an individual thing, but not as a group. The group couldn't give it, but you as an individual, yes. Great. Thank you. I see no problem with that at all. Any other questions or comments on the Eighth Tradition? Moving forward, Tradition 9, page 172. AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. The never be organized part, we seem to be experts at that in our personal <laughs> lives, so it's a cinch that we'll get this tradition right. Page 172, when Tradition 9... When Tradition 9 was written, it said that Alcoholics Anonymous needs the least possible organization. In years since then, we have changed our minds about that. Today, we are able to say with assurance that Alcoholics Anonymous, AA as a whole, should never be organized at all. Then, in seeming contradiction, we proceed to create special service boards and committees which in themselves are organized. How, then, can we have an unorganized movement which can and does create a service organization for itself? Scanning this puzzler, people say, what do they mean, no organization? Well, let's see. Did anyone ever hear of a nation, a church, a political party, even a benevolent association that had no membership rules? Did anyone ever hear of a society which couldn't somehow discipline its members and enforce obedience to necessary rules and regulations? Doesn't nearly every society on earth give authority to some of its members to impose ob obedience upon the rest and to punish or expel offenders? Therefore... Every nation, in fact, every form of society, has to be a government administered by human beings. Power to direct or govern is the es essence of organization everywhere. Yet, Alcoholics Anonymous is an exception. It does not conform to this pattern. 
Neither its General Service Conference, its Foundation Board, nor the humblest group committee can issue a single directive to an AA member and make it stick, let alone mete out any punishment. We've tried it lots of times, but utter failure is always the result. Groups have tried to expel members, but the, banishment, but the banished have come back to sit in the meeting place saying, this is life for us, you can't keep us out. Committees have instructed many in AA to stop working on a chronic backslider, only to be told, how, do, how I do my 12-step work is my business, who are you to judge? This doesn't mean an AA won't take advice or suggestions from more experienced members, but he surely won't take orders. Who is more unpopular than the old-time AA, full of wisdom, who moves to another area and tries to tell the group there how to run its business? He and all like him, who view with alarm for the good of AA, meet the most stubborn resistance or, worse still, laughter. You might think AA's headquarters in New York would be an exception. Surely the people there would have to have some authority. But long ago, trustees and staff members alike found that they could no, do no more than make suggestions, and very mild ones at that. They even had to coin a couple of sentences, which still go into half the letters they write. Of course, you are at perfect liberty to handle this matter any way you please. But the majority experience in AA does seem to suggest. Now that attitude is far removed from a central government, isn't it? We recognize that alcoholics can't be dictated to, individually or collectively. At this juncture, we can hear a churchman exclaim, they are making disobedience a virtue. He is joined by a psychiatrist who says, defiant brats, they won't grow up and conform to social usage. The man in the street says, I don't understand it, they must be nuts. But all these observers have overlooked something unique in Alcoholics Anonymous. Unless each AA member follows to the best of his ability our suggested 12 steps to recovery, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant. His drunkenness and disillusion are not penalties inflicted by people in authority. They result from his personal disobedience to spiritual principles. You'll remember that we, we spoke about that in the first tradition when we started. And in the very beginning in the foreword to this book, as we read, it says, AA's 12 steps are a set of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and make the sufferer happily and usefully whole. The steps, the 12 steps, are the 12 principles. You can find humility, honesty, open-mindedness, willingness. You can find all of those principles in almost all of the steps or in all of the steps. So there is no one set principle behind each step. It's up to us as individual members to conform to those spiritual principles. If we fail to work with steps, we fail to get the necessary connection with a higher power that gives us our sobriety, and we're not going to be able to stay sober. Because the fact is, if I do not take the suggestions, it's all the way it's presented to me, isn't it? I'm really given an order, but we like to couch it into a suggestion, or this is what we would do in our experience. But if I don't follow it, I know one thing that happens to me. Life will turn up the volume real loud, and I'm not going to like the results, what I'm hearing. It's just that simple. Do I follow what has been suggested to me, or do I follow what I want to do? Uh, if I get what I want, that's all I'm going to get. And that didn't work very good for me. And then uh, in the fifth tradition, we talk about each group has but one primary purpose to carry its message. And they're about to tell us that the same rule applies to the group as it does to the individual. Groups that fail to live according to the traditions don't stick around. You'll notice that when a group conscience wanes, when it's just a couple of people doing all the work and leading all the meetings, fewer people start going to those meetings. There's a meeting that I used to attend regularly that at any given day had 100 or more people in it. And, uh, and people stopped attending the group conscience, and they started doing things a little differently, reading things before the meeting, saying, you know, do this, do that, and, you know, different things where they tried to appoint their authority as, as the leaders of the group. Pretty soon, the meeting dwindled down to 10 or 15 people. Nobody participates in the group anymore because the group failed to adhere to the traditions. Middle of page 174, same stern threat. The same stern threat applies to the group itself. Unless there is approximate conformity to AA's 12 traditions, the group, too, can deteriorate and die. So we of AA 
do obey spiritual principles first because we must and ultimately because we love the kind of life such obedience brings. Great suffering and great love are AA's disciplinarians. We need no others. It is clear now that we ought never to name boards to govern us, but it is equally clear that we shall always need to authorize workers to serve us. It is the difference between the spirit of vested authority and the spirit of service, two concepts which are sometimes poles apart. It is in this spirit of service that we elect the AA Group's informal rotating committee, the Intergroup Association for the Area, and the General Service Conferences of Alcoholics Anonymous for AA as a whole. Even our foundation, once an independent board, is today directly accountable to our fellowship. Its trustees are the caretakers and expediters of our world service. Just as the aim of each AA member is personal sobriety, the aim of our services is to bring sobriety within reach of all who want it. If nobody does the group's chores, if the area's telephone rings unanswered, if we do not reply to our mail, then AA as we know it would stop. Our communications lines with those who need our help would be broken. AA has to function, but at the same time it must avoid those dangers of great wealth, prestige, and entrenched power which necessarily tempt other societies. Though Tradition 9 at first sight seems to deal with a purely practical matter, in its actual operation it discloses a society without organization, animated only by the spirit of service, a true fellowship. And when they say without organization, what they're talking about is leadership organization. And you can look at AA as an inverted pyramid where the member at the bottom is actually the one supporting AA the most. Each person and each member of Alcoholics Anonymous has an opinion and says what they think things should be. And that's what runs Alcoholics Anonymous. Nowhere is their leadership determining how everything else in AA should go. Normally, an, op an organization operates as a pyramid with the leader at top giving the word down how it should go. In Alcoholics Anonymous, it's the exact opposite. The membership body determines how IA should operate. Those things get passed on through the delegates to the General Service Committee. They vote on things. They make decisions. They pass those decisions on to the Board of Trustees, who then passes those decisions on to the General Service Office. And that's how things are determined in Alcoholics Anonymous. So any idea that you have of how you think things should go, bring it to a GSR for your home group, and they'll bring it to Macon, and it'll get voted on. That's why we have the GSR. Because they're supposed to, if, it was always my understanding, that they're supposed to kind of ask the group, what do you think? You know, let's get a pulse of that. So then they carry it. And they carry what the group decided and not what uh, the, that individual decides. I was just wondering with the GSR, what does that stand for? General Service Representative. Each group has a GSR. So the GSR goes to Macon, says, my group thinks we should do this. The folks in Macon will either take it up as a topic or not, based on a vote. And if they take it up, then they'll make a decision. They'll go back to the group and say, this is what they decided in Macon. The groups will say to their GSRs, we don't agree with that or we do agree with that. And that's how things move in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's why it's so important to be involved in the group conscience. Marilyn? Marilyn, alcoholic. Hi, Marilyn. The GSR can decide for the group ultimately if the group doesn't make a decision. The GSR is authorized just by the group to go ahead and make those decisions if, if for some reason the group doesn't. But they'll always take the counsel of the senior members of the group, not because they're the authority, but just because they have the AA experience. Any other questions or comments on the Ninth Tradition? Moving forward into the Tenth Tradition. This is Paul's favorite tradition because <laughs> his sponsor said, Paul, you have no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those were the good old days, weren't they, Paul? The good old days. <laughs> no, I, what he was talking about is early on when I got in and I was, I was running my gums about something at a meeting. And he said, you know, Paul, you have a lot of good opinions, just a lot. Let's not share them so much. Go ahead. Page 176, Tradition 10. Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, the A name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Never since it began has Alcoholics Anonymous been divided by a major controversial issue. 
nor has our fellowship ever publicly taken sides on any question in an embattled world. This, however, has been no earned virtue. It could almost be said that we were born with it, for as one old-timer recently declared, practically never have I heard a heated religious, political, or reform argument among AA members. So long as we don't argue these matters privately, it's a cinch we shall never publicly. As by some deep instinct, we AAs have known from the very beginning that we must never, no matter what the provocation, publicly take sides in any fight, even a worthy one. All history affords us the spectacle of striving nations and groups finally torn asunder because they were designed for or tempted into controversy. Others fell apart because of sheer self-righteousness while trying to enforce upon the rest of mankind some millennium of their own specification. In our own times, we have seen millions die in political and economic wars, often spurred by religious and racial difference. We live in the imminent possibility of a fresh holocaust to determine how men shall be governed and how the products of nature and toil shall be divided among them. That is the spiritual climate in which AA was born and by God's grace has nevertheless flourished. And what they're talking about is, is that AA was born just before World War II. And the world was a mess back then. You know, we that live today think we're unique. We're experiencing problems that haven't been experienced, but it's really history just repeating itself. And the problems that the world were faced with was tremendous when AA was first, first created. And no tradition really can bring more peace in my life than this one if I apply it. AA has no opinion on outside issues. If Ken had no opinion on outside issues, he'd be much happier. <laughs> and it, it's a cinch. If I would never argue these things privately, I'd never argue them publicly. And I fail at this tradition on a regular basis, unfortunately. Or I should say I used to fail. Now it's not as often because most of the time I bite my tongue a little bit. Most of the time. My wife would disagree. She's sitting over there smiling. She says, no, you air your opinion quite regularly. This is where a good, a good thought might be, never miss an opportunity to keep my big mouth shut. I would just at this point, uh, if you wouldn't mind, the long tradition is very important to me, the tenth. It's on page 192. No AA group or member, I'm a member, I'm in a group, should in any way implicate AA express any opinion on outside controversial issues, and he mentions three that are very vitally important. One, politics. Man, there's nothing that would, can cause a fire like politics. Two, alcohol reform. Well, this is the only way to be done. No, AA has our way, and it's worked very successfully for me. There's plenty of others. And sectarian religion. He's talking about a specific religion or a matter of faith. That's all we're talking about there. And if I don't argue those truly, whether it's in AA or even in private, I, I just don't like to discuss politics or any of that, quite frankly, at all, whether it's public or private. Hey. And a good rule of thumb, as I was told early on, how to adhere to this tradition, especially in an AA meeting. Never Mention a proper name, and you'll keep pretty clean. You won't, you won't, you'll you adhere to this tradition awful good. If I repeat, never mention a proper name. And Paul likes to say, never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. Another expression that's a good one to live by is that silence can never be misquoted, ever. A smile and a nod goes a long way. Amen. Continue, please, Mary Catherine, on the top of page 177. Let us reemphasize. Let us reemphasize that this reluctance to fight one another on or anybody else is not counted as some special virtue which makes us feel superior to other people. Nor does it mean that the members of Alcoholics Anonymous, now restored as citizens of the world, are going to back away from their individual responsibilities to act as they see the right, as they see the right upon issues of our time. But when it comes to AA as a whole. That's quite a different matter. In this respect, we do not enter into public controversy because we know that our society will perish if it does. We conceive the survival and spread of Alcoholics Anonymous to be something of far greater importance than the weight we could collectively throw back of any other cause. Since recovery from alcoholism is life itself to us, 
it is imperative that we preserve in full strength our means of survival. Maybe this sounds as though the alcoholics in AA had suddenly gone peaceable and become one great big happy family. Of course, this isn't so at all. Human beings that we are, we squabble. Before we leveled off a bit, AA looked more like one prodigious squabble than anything else, at least on the surface. A corporation director who had just voted a company expenditure of $100,000 would appear at an AA business meeting and blow his top over an outlay of $25 worth of needed postage stamps. Disliking the attempt of some to manage a group, half its membership might angrily rush off to form another group more to their liking. Elders, temporarily turned Pharisee, have sulked. Bitter attacks have been directed against people suspected of mixed motives. Despite their din, our puny rows never did AA a, partic a particle of harm. They were just part and parcel of learning to work and live together. Let it be noted, too, that they are almost always concerned with ways to make AA more effective, how to do the most good for the most alcoholics. The Washingtonian Society, a movement among alcoholics which started in Baltimore a century ago, almost discovered the answer to alcoholism. At first, the society was composed entirely of alcoholics trying to help one another. The early members foresaw that they should dedicate themselves to this sole aim. In many respects, the Washingtonians were akin to AA of today. Their membership passed the 100,000 mark. Had they been left to themselves and had they stuck to their one goal, they might have found the rest of the answer. But this didn't happen. Instead, the Washingtonians permitted politicians and reformers, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic, to use the society for their own purposes. Abolition of slavery, for example, was a stormy political issue then. Soon, Washingtonian speakers violently and publicly took sides on this question. Maybe the society could have survived the abolition controversy, but it didn't have a chance from the moment it determined to reform America's drinking habits. When the Washingtonians became temperance crusaders, within a very few years they had completely lost their effectiveness in helping alcoholics. The lesson to be learned from the Washingtonians was not overlooked by Alcoholics Anonymous. As we surveyed the wreck of that movement, early AA members resolved to keep our society out of public controversy. Thus was laid the cornerstone for tra Tradition 10. Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. And you'll notice this is the, the second tradition, the sixth tradition and this tradition specifically tell us we just don't get involved in outside issues. Religious holidays are wonderful things, but they're not AA business. We don't do toy drives for specific holidays. We don't put boxes in the middle of meetings to collect things for needy people. We just don't get involved in those things. That's not what we do. Alcoholics Anonymous has one thing that it does, and it does it really well. Help alcoholics get sober. Not that the other causes aren't worthy and deserving. And you may want to make an announcement in an AA meeting about something you're involved in, especially around the holidays, that you think is a wonderful idea. But it's not AA. It's just not AA. And our unity, as the first tradition reminds us in the fifth tradition, our unity is the most important thing that we have. So we always have to put aside, they're going to tell us this in the twelfth tradition as well, we always have to put aside our personal desires in favor of what's best for the group. No matter how strong we may believe in something, we have to put our personal desires aside for what's best for the group. And that can happen in my own personal life. If I get into a discussion with friends about this or that or one religion better than another, one political thought better than another, or alcohol reform better than another, I, I just need to stay out of arguments. Be a uniter, not a divider. And that's really what all, to me, these traditions, after we get there, we're always going back to tradition one, to unite the group and, to un and bring harmony into my life to bring harmony into my life. Any questions or comments on the 10th tradition before we move on? Tradition 11, page 180. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. So were we practicing this tradition when we advertised free donuts for this thing? 
That was kind of, that was pretty attractive. I see there's like, there's at least 100 people here just for the donuts. I have a feeling the Lord will forgive us. Oh, okay. Okay. Page 180. Without its legions. Without its legions of well-wishers, AA could never have grown as it has. Throughout the world, immense and favorable publicity of every description has been the principal means of bringing alcoholics into our fellowship. In AA offices, clubs, and homes, telephones ring constantly. One voice says, I read a piece in the newspapers. Another, we heard a radio program. And still, and still another, we saw a moving picture or we saw something about AA on television. It is no exaggeration to say that half of AA's membership has been led to us through channels like these. The inquiring voices are not all alcoholics or their families. Doctors read medical papers about Alcoholics Anonymous and call for more information. Clergymen see articles in their church journals and also make inquiries. Employers learn that great corporations have set their approval upon us and wish to discover what can be done about alcoholism in their own firms. Therefore, a great responsibility fell upon us to to develop the best possible public relations policy for Alcoholics Anonymous. Through many painful experiences, we think we have arrived at what that policy ought to be. It is the opposite in many ways of usual promotional practice. We found that we had to rely upon the principle of attraction rather than of promotion. And the the question comes up, does AA advertise? And no, AA does not advertise, nor does it compete with anybody, any treatment center or anything like that for membership. It's just not what AA does. AA will do public service announcements. And for most of us that are are good drunks, we're usually awake at 4 in the morning. We're we're generally the only people awake at 4 in the morning watching TV that's really worthless. And there's a public service announcement that comes on, and it shows a guy in a dark room drinking. And then it says, call Alcoholics Anonymous. They're not promoting AA. They're just saying AA's out there. And if you're up at 4 in the morning drinking, that's probably how you found out about AA. And even if you're not, I, I know been in cities during the day, especially during this time. They'll say something to the effect, if you want to drink, that's your business. If you want to stop, that's our business. And, and they're, they're just saying, we have a solution. They're not promoting it other than that ways. Go ahead. Page 181, top of the page. Let's see how. Let's see how these two contrasting ideas, attraction and promotion, work out. A political party wishes to win an election, so it advertises the virtues of its leadership to draw votes. A worthy charity wants to raise money. Forthwith, its letterhead shows the name of every distinguished person whose support can be obtained. Much of the political, economic, and religious life of the world is dependent upon publicized leadership. People who symbolize causes and ideas fill a deep human need. We of AA do not question that. But we do have to soberly face the fact that being in the public eye is hazardous, especially for us. By temperament, nearly every one of us had had been an irrepressible promoter, and the prospect of a society composed almost entirely of promoters was frightening. Considering this explosive factor, we knew we had to exercise self-restraint. The way this restraint paid off was startling. It resulted in more favorable publicity of Alcoholics Anonymous than could possibly have been obtained through all the arts and abilities of AA's best press agents. Obviously, AA had to be publicized somehow, so we resorted to the idea that it would be far better to let our friends do this for us. Precisely, that has happened, to an unbelievable extent. Veteran newsmen, trained doubters that they are, have gone all out to carry AA's message. To them, we are something more than the source of good stories. On almost every news front, the men and women of the press have attached themselves to us as friends. In the beginning, the press could not understand our refusal of all personal publicity. They were genuinely baffled by our insistence upon anonymity. Then they got the point. Here was something rare in the world, a society which said it wished to publicize its principles and its work, but not its individual members. The press was delighted with this attitude. Ever since, these friends have reported AA with an enthusiasm which the most ardent members would find hard to match. This is, uh, if you looked at the Jack Alexander story, Jack Alexander really uh, uh, kind of went into this uh, saying, I'm going to kind of badmouth AA. 
But the big deal was when he finished his article and, and he saw what a wonderful organization AA was, the editor of I wanted to see a picture, front picture of these people. Wilson and the rest of them said, no, we can't do that. But there was quite a little fight in there, as I understand it, because between that, eventually it got published. And thank God, because Jack Alexander, who became a friend, he wasn't an alcoholic, but became a friend, and he brought a lot of people to our organization, which helped the suffering alcoholic. And back again, you've got to realize, if I may please, because uh, I'm not a, uh, I was born in 37, so during those times, I'm, I'm well aware. Uh, I, I'd be amazed. I, I'm not so sure that my uncle read his article. And, uh, and, and that helped him get sober. Because there was no AA in my little area where I was born and raised. None whatsoever. A, a good friend of ours that uh, started one of the local clubs from a resentment in a coffee pot from another clubhouse when he moved to Atlanta was, uh, was one of the Oakland Eight, which were the group of guys who started Alcoholics Anonymous guys and one lady who started Alcoholics Anonymous in Oakland, California. And he and uh, his buddy got thrown out of a bar and the bartender threw him out in the middle of the day and he said, you get out of my bar. And they asked why and he said, I didn't open this bar to serve people like you. You're alcoholics. And, uh, and the bartender said, you need to go read about that organization, Alcoholics Anonymous, from New York. So they went down to the library, and they got a copy of the Jack Alexander article, and they read it. And that's how they started AA in Oakland, California. Continue, please, on page 182, middle of the page. There was actually... There was actually a time when the press of America thought the anonymity of AA was better for us than some of our own members did. At one point, about a hundred of our society were breaking anonymity at the public level. With perfectly good intent, these folks declared that the principle of anonymity was horse and buggy stuff, something appropriate to AA's pioneering days. They were sure that AA could go faster and farther if it availed itself of modern publicity methods. AA, they pointed out, included many persons of local, national, or international fame. Provided they were willing, and many were, why shouldn't their membership be publicized, thereby encouraging others to join us? These were plausible arguments, but happily our friends of the writing profession disagreed with them. The Foundation wrote letters to practically every news outlet in North America, setting forth our public relations policy of attraction rather than promotion and emphasizing personal anonymity as AA's greatest protection. Since that time, Editors and rewrite men have repeatedly deleted names and pictures of members from AA copy. Frequently, they have reminded ambitious individuals of AA's anonymity policy. They have even sacrificed good stories to this end. The force of their cooperation has certainly helped. Only a few AA members are left who deliberately break anonymity at the public level. This, in brief, is the process by which AA's Tradition 11 was constructed. To us, however, it represents far more than a sound public relations policy. It is more than a denial of self-seeking. This tradition is a constant and practical reminder that personal ambition has no place in AA. In it, each member becomes an active guardian of our fellowship. The importance of whatever I'm doing is that it bears no name. And even though it's true that today there are people actors and such who break their anonymity at the public level and there's a good number of media outlets that don't respect the principle of anonymity and you know we have to hold ourselves to account for that because we unfortunately just don't talk about the traditions enough so it's easy to come to plenty of AA meetings and never know that anonymity is the foundation principle of all of our traditions the spirit of bearing no name who I am is not important Myself as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is between me and AA. It's not something I broadcast to anybody in the world. Moving forward with great alacrity, Tradition 12, the granddaddy of them all. Probably the one that's most often misunderstood. Tradition 12, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Page 184. The spiritual substance of anonymity is sacrifice. Because AA's 12 traditions repeatedly ask us to give up personal desires for the common good, we realize that the sacrificial spirit, well symbolized by anonymity, is the foundation of them all. It is AA's proved willingness to make these sacrifices that gives people their high confidence in our future. 
But in the beginning, anonymity was not born of confidence. It was the child of our early fears. Our first nameless groups of alcoholics were secret societies. New prospects could find us only through a few trusted friends. The bare hint of publicity, even for our work, shocked us. Though ex-drinkers, we still thought we had to hide from public distrust and contempt. When the big book appeared in 1939, we called it Alcoholics Anonymous. Its foreword made this revealing statement. It is important that we remain anonymous because we are too few at present to handle the overwhelming number of personal appeals which may result from this publication. Being mostly business or professional folk, we could not well carry on our occupations in such an event. Between these lines, it is easy to read our fear that large numbers of incoming people might break our anonymity wide open. As the AA groups multiplied, so did anonymity problems. Enthusiastic over the spectacular recovery of a brother alcoholic, we'd sometimes discuss those intimate and harrowing aspects of his case meant for his sponsor's years alone. The aggrieved victim would then rightly declare that his trust had been broken. When such stories got into circulation outside of AA, the loss of confidence in our anonymity promise was severe. It frequently turned people from us. Clearly, every AA member's name and story, too, had to be confidential if he wished. This was our first lesson in the practical application of anonymity. What that means is, is that often we'll hear people in a meeting, at the end of the meeting, here at least they say some statement about the 12th tradition, like what you heard here, let it stay here when you leave here. That's not the 12th tradition. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions. Please respect this and treat in confidence who you see and what you hear here. If, if a meeting says, well, what you hear here, let it stay here, don't say anything, then I may hear something from an individual that could help me or someone, a, sp a sponsoree or something. Well, if I adhere to that strictly, I can't pass that word on. What I need to do, it says, show respect and confidence. I don't identify the person. I don't identify the meeting. I don't identify anything. I just say, I heard this. And I think this may help you or help me, whatever the situation is. Say, uh, uh, I will go a little further on, if you wouldn't mind. That uh, this, this is out of uh, some of our pamphlet, Understanding Anonymity. And <clears throat> this is probably the most violated uh, principle from my point of view in an AA meeting. Person doesn't give their name, and what do you hear? Who are you? Who are you? No, it's none of your business who I am. I have a right to come into a meeting and share. Respect the right of, of other members to maintain their anonymity at whatever level they wish. So if I, if I want to even tell another name, if I just want to start sharing, I have that right without anyone putting pressure on me saying, who are you, who are you? It does go on, and I'm not going to read it all. It does say, though, that... If I'm a, uh, definitely if I'm a member, if I'm a member and I'm an officer, it says, use last names within the fellowship, especially for election of group officers and other service jobs. So uh, the, the idea, quite frankly, is to use your full name in the fellowship. Now, you don't have to, though. You don't have to use anything. But my point is, let the individual share and address themselves as they desire. Let them do that without me trying to control them. So it's okay to say, I heard this at a meeting once. It's not okay to say that I heard John say this at a meeting Tuesday when I was there. <laughs> Similarly, you don't want to share things with somebody in the program in a way that they could easily identify the person that shared it. So you don't share their personal details. And the paragraph we just read about keeping confidence, if somebody shares something with you in private, don't share it in public. It's that simple. If somebody shares something in confidence, you don't share it with somebody else. Right. And it's okay to ask somebody when they say something, would you mind if I said that to somebody else? It's just a personal thing, but I do in this. If, 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 if something's beyond my pay grade, you know, and there's plenty of it that is, you know, when they might tell me how to raise a child or having trouble with the, with the, with the spouse. 
that's starting to get beyond my pay grade. I'm single. So what I'll do is I'll tell my sponsoree, let me call someone. Would you be receptive to talk to somebody else? And I'll call that person and I'll ask them, would you mind if this person calls you that I give the number? So I get, I get that person's approval. I know I'm going to get the approval. You, I've never been denied. But I still, it's important that I ask for that. Middle of page 185, with characteristic. With characteristic and temperance, however, some of our newcomers cared not at all for secrecy. They wanted to shout AA from the housetops and did. Alcoholics barely dry rushed about bright-eyed, buttonholing anyone who would listen to their stories. Others hurried to place themselves before microphones and cameras. Sometimes they got distressingly drunk and let their groups down with a bang. They had changed from AA members into AA show-offs. This phenomenon of contrast really set us thinking. Squarely before us was the question, how anonymous should an AA member be? Our growth made it plain that we couldn't be a secret society, but it was equally plain that we couldn't be a vaudeville circuit either. The charting of a safe path between these extremes took a long time. As a rule, the average newcomer wanted his family to know immediately what he was trying to do. He also wanted to tell others who had tried to help him, his doctor, his minister, and close friends. As he gained confidence, he felt it right to explain his new way of life to his employer and business associates. When opportunities to be helpful came along, he found he could talk easily about AA to almost anyone. These quiet disclosures helped him to lose his fear of the alcoholic stigma and spread the news of AA's existence in his community. Many a new man and woman came to AA because of such conversations. Though not in the strict letter of anonymity, such communications were well within its spirit. But it became apparent that the word-of-mouth method was too limited. Our group as such needed to be publicized. The AA groups would have to reach quickly as many despairing alcoholics as they could. Consequently, many groups began to hold meetings which were open to interested friends and the public so that the average citizen could see for himself just what AA was all about. The response to these meetings was warmly sympathetic. Soon, groups began to receive requests for AA speakers to appear before civic organizations, church groups, and medical societies. Provided anonymity was maintained on these platforms and reporters present were cautioned against the use of names or pictures, the result was fine. Then came our first few excursions into major publicity, which were breathtaking. Cleveland's Plain Dealer articles ran us about us ran that town's membership into a, from a few into hundreds overnight. The news stories of Mr. Rockefeller's dinner for Alcoholics Anonymous helped double our total membership in a year's time. Jack Alexander's famous Saturday Evening Post piece made AA a national institution. Such tributes as these brought opportunities for still more recognition. Other newspapers and magazines wanted AA stories. Film companies wanted to photograph us. Radio and finally television besieged us with requests for appearances. What should we do? As this tide offering top public approval swept in, we realized that it could do us incalculable good or great harm. Everything would depend upon how it was channeled. We simply couldn't afford to take the chance of letting self-appointed members present themselves as messiahs representing AA before the whole public. The promoter instinct in us might be our undoing if even one publicly got drunk or was lured into using AA's name for his own purposes, the damage might be irreparable. At this altitude, press, radio, films, and tev televisions, anonymity, 100% anonymity, was the only possible answer. Here, principles would have to come before personalities without exception. If I speak publicly as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and then I turn around and do something which, as we know many in Hollywood do, it disparages Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and the worst thing that can happen is that somebody looks at it and says, oh, that AA doesn't work. And then we miss the opportunity to be of service. And it can hurt within the AA group if I gossip. I need to not gossip about things. What, what another AA person does, again, is none of my business and I shouldn't gossip about it. And they say that on page 185, just plain and clear in the top paragraph. That it's just not my job to talk about what other people in AA do. It's just not my place. Finishing up on page 187, these experience. 
These experiences taught us that anonymity is real humility at work. It is an all-pervading spiritual quality which today keynotes AA life everywhere. Moved by the spirit of anonymity, we try to give up our natural desires for personal distinction as AA members, both among fellow alcoholics and before the general public. As we lay aside these very human aspirations, we believe that each of us takes part in the weaving of a protective mantle which covers our whole society and under which we may grow and work in unity. We are sure that humility, expressed by anonymity, is the greatest safeguard that Alcoholics Anonymous can ever have. Let me tell you a little bit how that was uh, taught to me. You've been to uh, functions where it's been a ceremony, maybe it was a good charity, and the chairperson gets up there and says, now let's give old Jane a hand for the hard work she's done getting the membership out. Let's give old Peter a good hand for raising all this money. By the way, let's give uh, Joe and Susie over there a big hand for putting this nice dinner together. And then the chairperson says, and let's give a good warm clap and hand warm shake. All those too numerous to mention. I need to be in the too numerous to mention crowd <laughs> and stay there. So the 12th tradition tells us that, that anonymity, this idea that we don't bear our own name, publicly when we're talking about AA, and similarly, we don't identify other members of AA as being specifically oriented with anything that we're going to say. It's just not our place to do that. Any questions about the anonymity or about the 12th tradition? Hi, I'm Clay, and I'm alcoholic. Clay? Um, tradition 4 and 12, and I, I've been sitting here thinking, I think I know the difference, but I was hoping uh, one or both of you could comment on that and, and maybe contrast Tradition four with autonomy is specifically saying that each group is an individual organization and they shouldn't do things that would influence other organizations and other groups, nor should they adapt any policies or affiliation with any other group. And the principle of anonymity, as we talk about in the twelfth tradition, is my personal anonymity, specifically that you know I should blend in rather than stand out. What else? Please. I'm Smitty. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, I'm Smitty. Uh, I remember when I got sober, uh, I remember going to different AA groups, and in one meeting, they would pass the basket. In the beginning of the meeting, I go to another group, they pass the basket toward the end of the meeting. And I understood that that was because they took a group conscience, each of those groups did, and they decided something that didn't affect another group, it didn't affect how AA operated. It was just the way that that group decided to run their particular meeting. And that gave me a good idea of what, what autonomy was when it came to what meeting members voted on in their group conscience meetings about how they wanted to operate their group. It came, sometimes it just came down to procedural stuff that they did in their meetings. And that's what that autonomy thing meant to me that, as I understood it when I first got sober. So. One more in the back here, please. My name is John. I'm alcoholic. When talking about the uh, only requirement for AA membership is a desire to start stop drinking, we've noticed, uh, uh, and I don't know how to what level it's been discussed, but um, there are a lot of attendees at AA um, uh, meetings that uh, are fulfilling the requirement recommended to them by um, a judge that they attend AA meetings, and they may not at that point um, have a desire to stop drinking. Has there been anything written to groups from, uh, you know, the central office addressing that? John, I know that there's a particular area that I go to, and uh, the courts up there automatically, if, if uh, you were hit with a DUI, Automatically, they give you a, it's a green card, and the courts say you go to so many AA meetings. It's up. Uh, th there's one of these things. Where some things aren't black and white, and so some of the meetings, when you look in the schedule, will say no signing of court cards. Other groups have said we'll sign those court cards. So it, it's pretty much up uh, uh, to the thing. It's my understanding that up in that area, it's in Nebraska. Uh, and they have not taken a position, the central office and in, in the state, they haven't taken a position other than to say it's, it's up to the uh, individual group. Back in the 80s, the uh, central office in New York, the GSO, put out 
the, uh, what we call the blue card. And the blue card has a statement about what a closed meeting and what an open meeting is. So each meeting is free to choose whether it wants to be open or closed. And in you know, the second half of your question, anybody can go to an open meeting. And you don't have to declare yourself an alcoholic to go to meetings. To be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is a different thing. You're welcome to go to AA meetings and not be members of Alcoholics Anonymous. At a closed meeting, they ask that only alcoholics share. And if you ever are confused, if you look at your schedule, you'll find that there'll be an O, which means open meeting, or a C, which means a closed. It may say CD, closed discussion meetings. And that's, that's the distinction, how you can tell. Open meetings are open to everybody, and if you've got a court paper to be signed, take it to an open meeting. Closed meetings are for people who define themselves as alcoholics. And if you feel more comfortable going to a closed meeting, then that's what you should focus on. Mary Catherine has a question. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, Mary Catherine, alcoholic. Hey, Mary. When reading these traditions and um, talking about them in our groups and when they are, in my mind, being broken... How to be a uniter rather than a divider. I'm finding that that is kind of a challenge. And um, not wanting to be the bleeding deacon and not wanting to quit the group, <laughs> you know, because I believe it's a, it's a very important group for my sobriety and for others, I think. How do we approach that? You'll notice that in the... Uh in the traditions where it talks about the comparison between the elder statement and the bleeding deacon on, on page 135 in Tradition 2, it talks about the elder statesman being the person who's approached by members of the group for their information and their, their knowledge in, in AA. And it, it, it's urgently important for old-timers, people who have been sober and experienced these things, to share that experience. But it's equally important that the people who need the advice, wish to have it. And uh, for myself, the way that I, I address that when I hear somebody that may be in conflict with the tradition is I'll ask them, would you like to know something about the traditions that's relative to what you're talking about? And sometimes they'll say yes, and sometimes they'll say no. And I take a page out of what the General Service Office does, and whenever I'm offering an opinion or information about a tradition and what it says in the 12 and 12, I'll suggest you should read this from the 12 and 12. You're free to handle it any way you'd like, but this is what AA experience shows. You know, most often in, in an AA meeting and, and, you know, in direct conflict with the traditions, some people like to read things that are in AA-approved literature. And so I may mention to that person after the meeting, do you know that there's a tradition that tells us we ought not read those things? Sometimes if I'm in a meeting and somebody is going to egregiously violate a tradition, I'll interrupt before they do. And I'll say, I'm Ken, I'm an alcoholic. This is what the traditions tell us to do. You're welcome to do whatever you want, but this is what the traditions tell us to do. One more thing yeah. about the um, who are you. <laughs> I sometimes will say, they don't have to say. <laughs> That's a little contentious, though, isn't it? <laughs> I ought to keep my mouth shut more often than not, but sometimes I think that's important for someone who's coming to a meeting. And that, that could be something you could bring up in a group conscience and in your initial reading of things you could say, uh, uh, this, group, this group has decided, whatever the wording is, this group has decided you can, uh, you can name yourself any way you wish, you can share without even giving your name. Something to that approach, say. And when they all shout out and, you know, it's more of the treatment center babies than anybody else, so tell us your name, because in group you have to do that. You can say, remember the 12th tradition says that we are anonymous and nobody's required to say their name before they share. You can say that. And you can say it, you know, in a very gentle way. I know you can, I can't, but that's fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Once again, I want to thank John, Mike, and Steve for the production and for bringing the donuts especially. Yeah. 
and our wonderful reader, Mary Catherine, for doing such a great job.